What are psychopaths? Do social vampires walk among us? Have you ever met anyone who seems to behave like a predator? Today, we're going to be talking about psychopathy. And we're going to be finding out whether you might have psychopaths living in your life. According to some psychological studies, it's estimated that one in 25 people are psychopaths. How do you identify them and how do these people work? Are they like vampires living among us, parasitically sucking the energy and resources away from the rest of us? Are they predators whose mental disorder is really just an adaptation for survival, much like lions on the savanna? Or are psychopaths just fictional creatures from scary movies? In his book, The Psychopath Code, written in 2015, Peter Hingens makes the case that psychopaths are indeed human predators that walk among us, and that like other predators, they evolved in a delicate balance with their ecosystem. They lack empathy for others because according to Hingens, they can only feel a few emotions, those he calls the predator emotions, which supposedly evolved long before humans. Normal or social humans have a much wider range of emotions that psychopaths are unable to feel. And so anytime a psychopath appears to be showing one of these more social emotions, it is an act. Thanks, Chris. So according to Hinchins, most people, social humans, have a wide range of emotions that bond us with our family, with our social groups, with our tribe. But psychopaths only experience predatory emotions and anything that they might express is actually an analog of these emotions that have evolved to catch prey. So there's nine emotions that he attributes to the the entire emotional model of the psychopath. The first is hunger. The next is obsession, like obsession with your prey. The next is euphoria, which is a feeling of complete euphoria that you get if you're chasing down your prey. Next is glee, which is kind of like a joy at your success. Fury, similar to anger. Bloodlust, the insatiable desire to kill. Gluttony. satiation and blocked frustration if you're not getting what you want. These nine emotions make up the entire emotional profile of a psychopath. Now, it should be noted that psychopathy as a disorder does not actually appear in the DSM-5, and it's relatively controversial whether it even exists. But before we move on, does anyone have anything they'd like to add to flesh out this model a little bit? As, as Katie said, this, this is not in the, in the DSM-5, and this model is coming from this guy, Peter Hintgens, who isn't a, a psychologist. He's actually, um, uh, he was, a, he was a, a software developer, and he, he came up with this whole model. And so it's, it's very controversial, and that's why I, I like it, because I think there's a, a lot we can dig into. Um, and, and so one of the things is that it's, it's, one of the important things to remember is that it's absolutely not easy to identify who is a psychopath and who is not because psycho precisely because psychopaths are good at appearing to be, to look like the general population. And so, um, as I was reading this book, you know, I was kind of like thinking of different people, you know, like, Oh, is this person or is that person? And it's kind of like, you know, the, the only way you can really know is by like, like really getting into a close relationship w- with the person or, or the people that they're close with. And being very, very calm and methodical and, and stuff. I think it's really important to note, like in, in popular culture, sometimes we still have the idea of a psychopath as a serial killer. So like Norman Bates or Patrick Bateman, but that's not really what we're talking about. Uh, and that's not what, what the book's talking about. It's, it's talking more about people who are drains on organizations or like crazy girlfriends controlling boyfriends who, who suck your finances out of you and that sort of thing. Yes, exactly. So basically, Hinchin says, uh, yeah, we, while we like to think about these kind of um, sensational uh, serial killer type psychopaths, that the, the normal everyday psychopaths are much more hidden and much more sort of banal almost. Um, but almost all of us have had s- some kind of relationship that we feel the, I mean, you can if you talk to somebody who's in one of these relationships, they'll say like, yeah, it feels like my energy is being sucked out of me. Um, and so Hinchins basically says, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's what's happening. These, these people are actually, are actually predators and they, and they prey upon other humans. So um, it's kind of, it's kind of uh, scary and weird to think about that there might be people like this. And at the other time, at, at the same time, it, 
it kind of made sense to me as I was reading it. Do you guys believe in psychopathy? I'm still not sure if I believe in psychopathy because I've met many, many people over the course of my life and people throw around these statistics saying like 1% or 4% of the population are psychopaths. And I, there's not really many clear cases where I can point to a person and say, yes, that, that person is definitely a psychopath or something like that. Like I've met a lot of people who, who can be cruel, manipulative, liars, uh, have, have a very strange relationship with the truth. But I can also make counter cases and say, well, here's a situation where this person demonstrated empathy or they, they showed that they actually cared about other people and, and this kind of thing. So it is a very gray area. And so I, when, when somebody tells me flat out, oh, yes, psychopaths are real and I, I met one, I, I have to question it because I, I don't have that reference point in my own experience. I definitely believe in this cluster of, of traits as something that exists in humans, like people who tend to behave in more of a leeching or quote unquote predatory way rather than a productive way. I think that definitely exists. And I also have encountered people who don't seem to feel fear or remorse or things of that nature. So I would say, yes, I do believe in psychopaths. I, I agree with Kurt, though. I think it's more of a gray area than it is a binary. Like, I don't think there's just a psychopath gene and you either are or you aren't. Um, that's not really what Peter Hinchins is saying either. He, he pretty, he explains how, like, psychopathy is a combination of genetics and upbringing. Um, I would say I do tend to believe in psychopathy. Like, I, I see value in... I do see the value in a worldview of uh, abandoning the idea of psychopathy and just trying to see the, assuming the good in every single person, but I also think there can be danger in that. And in my experience, I have met people who meet the definition, who meet his model pretty well, although I do have some hesitancy of applying the label of psychopath to anyone for various reasons. Yeah, so so Hingens does say that... Um, Basically, we all carry the, the, the predator genes inside of us and that uh, the vast majority of us just don't express those genes. And, uh, and that psychopaths are people who do. He's not saying either of those things. He's not saying it's purely genetic or purely environmental. He's saying there's genes that bias you towards psychopathy, but they have to be fostered. So we're, all able, we're all able to express the predator behavior to a certain extent, but there's certain genes that bias people towards psychopathy. There's clusters of genes so some people have those genes, and those genes are a necessary precondition to being a psychopath, but you also need to have environmental factors. Mm, sure. I mean, I guess it's hard to say whether, um, you know, if somebody doesn't express a gene, whether, they're, whether they have it and they're not expressing it or whether they simply don't have it. Um, but I, I think that's maybe, maybe getting a little too much in the weeds. But, but I do think... I'm not really arguing what is or isn't genetically. I'm just saying Peter Hinchins does say there are some genes that make people more likely to be psychopaths and that not all people have those genes. Okay. Yeah, I guess I remember that he says that. Um, I, I do. I think I, I do believe in psychopathy. I think that um, it's not as black and white as Hinchins makes it out to be. He 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 seems to think you know you can't be like halfway psychopath, and I think that's that's weird because to me it it, it does seem like a spectrum to me. It seems like uh, there are people that I can point to who absolutely seem to be psychopaths. You know, if you look at famous historical figures like um, you know. Stalin and, and, and Mao and, and Hitler and, and all of those people. I mean, you know, maybe those specific people, you know, weren't psychopaths, but it seems like there, there have been enough sort of monsters um, throughout history that we can all think about that. It seems like some people are very, very far on, onto the psychopath end of the spectrum. Um, so I, I think there's a, a very much larger amount of people who are kind of in a more gray area. Um, but nevertheless, yeah, express these psychopathic tendencies. Yeah. And like Hinchins isn't, the argument isn't that everybody that does terrible atrocities is a psychopath because there's a lot of other motivations for doing atrocities than psychopathy. Like the idea is like psychopaths, they're not supposed to feel the emotion of fear, really. They're not supposed to feel empathy, but there's, you know, empathy and fear can be 
great motivations for doing terrible things. I mean, of those three figures you mentioned, like it seems to me Stalin was probably a psychopath, but it's not clear to me that either Mao or Hitler necessarily was a psychopath, even though their atrocities, you know, equaled or outstripped those of Stalin. Right. And, and Hingens does mention that uh, it is possible to, to be, to, to, yeah, to commit horrible atrocities and still be able to feel empathy. And he, he even says, I, you know, probably some of the worst monsters in history were not psychopaths. They were actually sort of social people that, that, you know, believed that they were doing the right thing or something like that. <laughs> Um, so how, how about you and, uh, you, Katie and Kurt, what do you guys think about, um, do you think this is kind of a black and white thing? Do you think it's kind of like you are a psychopath or are you not, you're not, or do you think it's more of a spectrum? I guess that it's a spectrum, but I, I don't really know. It's, a, it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to know. Uh, maybe if I could meet somebody someday who is somehow labeled it a psychopath by you know it's it's a weird thing too because a psychologist isn't necessarily going to call somebody a psychopath they might say that they have uh, antisocial personality disorder but it's much less likely they'll say they're a psychopath so it's hard to like get that pure sample that i can analyze and and then get a a better baseline for it so i i say like probably like most things it's a, it's a spectrum I mean, I'd be curious, Kurt, these people you talk about who lie and manipulate and uh, for personal gain, and yet you say they demonstrate empathy. Like, how do you know the empathy is not a lie? I don't. I can never know for sure. But I'm talking about mostly about the, the people I met when I worked in sales. So I'm working in these door-to-door sales offices. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's <laughs> there's a lot of characters. If if you watch that movie, you see the characters like the the person who schmoozes, the the pathetic salesperson, and the the the, the sharp and cunning, the manipulative, and all of those characters come into it. That uh, that uh, play was based on the real experiences of the author. And I'm thinking about a, a boss of mine. And he would lie a lot. You start to lie and you start to forget that you're even lying. And you say these little lies. So we would say, tell customers like, oh, yeah, we've just been signing up all your neighbors for this phone plan and they're all on it and they all love it. And it's not true. We sign up maybe one or two people a day, but we tell them that and Sooner or later, we forget that it's even a lie. We forget that we're even like the words become meaningless. It's just something that that you repeat. And then my boss would take it to this other level where he'd give these motivational speeches and he's talking about, you know, we're going to d- dominate the world and we're going to set up sales offices in this country and that country. And I don't think he saw it as a lie. I don't, I don't think he exactly believed it either. But afterwards, I mean, he was my friend, well, even though he's a, a bold, bold-faced liar. He is my, he was my friend, and uh, and afterwards we still had a, a a pretty good friendship, even though the the company broke up and a whole bunch of weird stuff happened. Uh, I I talked to him later, and and he he wasn't trying to gain anything from me. We would just chat, and in my heart of hearts, I believe that, that he's a good guy, even though he, you know, he did, we all did some strange things and, and a whole bunch of lies. So there's no reason for him just to, to make talk with me. Like he wasn't trying to get money out of me or scam me or anything like that. So that's one case, but uh, there are, there are other cases I could probably look at and make a firmer case that somebody actually was a psychopath. So I just want to respond to, to your sort of um, your argument that because he didn't prey on you, that he wasn't a predator at all. And I, I think that's a little bit of a fallacy because, um, you know, a, a predator is not going to prey on all possible prey. They're only going to pick the prey that they believe that they can dominate, that they can defeat. And so, you know, while a predator might look like a totally normal human being to you, they might actually be preying on somebody else at the same time. 
Um, so, but you know, this, yeah. Yeah, that that's true. But you know, we could, I guess we could say that about anybody, but yeah, that, I mean, I had another colleague and I remember it was like my first day knocking on doors and I was like, well, this, uh, this guy is uh, bending the truth a little with it. And, and this, this other salesman said, well, I don't care. I'll tell, I'll tell customers everything. I'll tell, I'll tell them I have five kids and a baby on the way and patted his belly like he's about to give birth. So <laughs> uh, he just didn't care about the, the, the truth, I'd say. And then later when I was working selling power uh, electricity discounts, like changing people's power companies, there were people who would – go to the door and they would act as if they were they're working for energy australia and they're like a, a linesman or something like they're doing some work on the lines and they're like well listen we're changing your your company over this is just something that we have to do we do it for everybody and they say it very matter of factly and they're basically pretending that they're they're going through a a, a process of switching people over when actually what they're doing is they're they're a salesman and they would tell them well look you have to go through with it. I don't know what you're talking about. Like you have objections. We have to put you on this contract. There's no way around it. So <laughs> that's another extreme sort of sales tactic or sales lie that people would do. And as far as I could tell, some of these people would just not feel remorse about this at all. So This is a good example. I was a salesperson for a while also. And I didn't find salespeople in general to be psychopathic amongst themselves, you know, the way that we behaved coworker to coworker. So I wouldn't label anyone a psychopath in that organization, at least that I can think of. However, the process of being a salesperson and the job itself, not all types of sales, but a lot of types of sales basically train you to have a psychopathic orientation towards your potential customer. Like you are kind of looking at them like prey and trying to manipulate them into getting what you want. There's different kinds of sales where you're actually trying to see if you're a good fit, but I, the, the job is to try to, to try to get that customer at the end of the day. So I, I see what you mean. Uh, the, the way that I look at psychopathy and I don't know if this is exactly how it's supposed to be in this model or how psychologists look at psychopathy or don't, but I see I see it as kind of an orientation towards looking at people and towards looking at the world like that, that could be applied some of the time towards some people, or it could be applied more all of the time. And I think that there's some people who can switch in and out of that, like salespeople being a, a prime example, like all of those emotions, like bloodlust, glee, obsession, like, all of that seems to be kind of the emotions that salespeople have towards their potential customers when they're in sales mode in general. And I totally believe that there are some people who approach the world, the world that way all the time. Yes. So a lot of these old school salespeople have this adversarial mindset, like it's us versus the customer. And this is, this is how you get the customer. And it is like that predatory thing. Like you're going to, you're going to, sort of trick them into signing up. And I, I've done th things too that I'm not proud of, like signing up old ladies who were actually senile. And I remember when, I've, when I left one of my sales jobs, uh, they, my, my boss had listened to the call where I'd actually refused to sign up this woman who was, who was senile. And he was like, this is not good, Kurt. You've got to sign up those old ladies, <laughs> even if they're senile. I was like, okay, I'm not going to work here anymore. This isn't right. So, so finally found that line. But before that, I mean, my, my point is to bring back what you were saying, Chris, about seeing people as prey. Well, we all did it. But does that mean I'm a psychopath now? Right. So I think the, the, the crux of the issue is, and this is why it's such a difficult problem, uh, is, you know, you could, the, the diagnosis, the, the, 
the defining feature of a psychopath is that they don't feel empathy for anyone. Um, and so you can only know that by being in the psychopath's mind. Um, and be, you have to, you can only know that by being a social human in a psychopath's mind because the psychopath doesn't know what social emotion, like regular emotions feel like. So even the psychopath might not even be able to say whether they can feel empathy. Um, and, but, so, and then of course there are all these gray areas where like you might have, you might have people who feel empathy, a lot of empathy towards sort of their in-group, but then they feel a lot of hostility and no empathy at all, and maybe even predatory emotions towards their out-group. These examples would not be considered to be psychopathic. Like a salesperson who's predatory in their role or a person who's tribalistic would not be considered to be psychopathic. The defining feature of a psychopath isn't that they're, or one of the defining features isn't that they're able to feel predatory towards other human beings, it's that they're only able to feel predatory towards other human beings. Basically, there's there's... There's no way to distinguish that, you know, not being able to feel empathy for anyone and, um, in a, like have effectively having an in-group of one, having an in-group of yourself, um, which could potentially expand to other people in the future, but just, it isn't right now. If somebody, you know, has never felt empathy for another human being or isn't feeling empathy right now, does that mean they aren't capable of ever experiencing empathy for anyone? I think it's hard to say. And I think maybe, um, you know, maybe a, a, a good effective definition of psychopathy might be, you know, this person just has extremely low empathy. I mean, I don't know, like maybe, but I don't really see that we see that many stories about like someone who was, who discovers empathy as an adult, like someone who was like, oh yeah, I was, I was like completely devoid of empathy and I didn't even know what I was missing, but then I met the right person and I had an experience and my heart bloomed in love. And since then I've had the full complement of human emotions. Like we just don't really hear stories like that. We don't hear too many stories about what it's like being a psychopath from inside their mind. So it, it would be even rarer that we would find a story talking about a, a psychopath who bloomed into having I, a human soul. I, I actually read a, I actually read a book about that was, by James Fallon. It was called The Psychopath Inside. And he was basically this neurologist studying psychopathy. And he got one of his own brain scans mixed up with the psychopath's brain scans. And he found out that he had the psychopath, the psychopathic brain. And it was a weird thing. And then he sort of started like embraced that identity of being a psychopath. And the book was sort of both an autobiography and a discussion of the neurology and biology of psychopathy. And it was interesting because through that process, it didn't seem that he developed empathy. He just developed self-awareness. That is interesting. I, I think that there is a difference between people who don't feel empathy for others or have an in-group, out-group, or, or like who have an in-group, out-group kind of thing and maybe don't feel empathy for a lot of other people and people who just cannot feel empathy, like, like Ariel, what you described, there does seem to be kind of a quote unquote psychopathic brain or at least certain tendencies in brain development or people who are psychopathic and maybe they are incapable of, of feeling it in some sense. One thing the book describes is like how psychopathy is, is adaptive in some ways. Like if you're able to just not feel a lot of the emotions that people normally feel, then it can give you advantages. Like you can just lie, cheat, and steal without any kind of expenditure of energy. Whereas with a, a normal person, what he calls social humans, if you go around like cheating and lying and you get, you get stressed and afraid and guilty and you get like all like the emotions can hold you back from certain kinds of strategies. So the idea is that for a psychopath, it's, it's sort of a self, psychopathy is self-reinforcing both in the individual and in generationally within the species. Yeah, it seems like the only disadvantage would be if other people realized that you were a psychopath and then excluded you. And that's that's built into the strategy as well. There's mechanisms for that because if that happens, then you move on to a different community. And psychopaths tend to have a high level of charisma and outgoingness mm -hmm. because they're not held back. They're not held back by like social anxiety and stuff that holds most people back. So they, they're able to adapt to a new community pretty quickly. And also because it, a psychopath is supposedly so good at lying, they can turn other members of a group against the accuser. Yeah. I, I wanted to note too, there's a difference between empathy, like 
actually feeling other people's emotions or feeling bad when you see someone else feel bad and cognitive empathy, which is where you know that this is making somebody feel bad. So you choose not to do it. And psychopaths can definitely have cognitive empathy and they could use that in order to take more advantage of people or in order to be a nice person. Yeah. The tip of the, the classical way that it's divided up is there's an idea that psychopaths have cognitive empathy, but not emotional empathy. So they, they can tell consciously that you're sad, but they don't feel anything. It doesn't make them feel anything except maybe like um, excitement at whatever opportunity it opens up. Whereas uh, people who are autistic uh, feel emotional empathy, but not cognitive empathy. So if you're sad, they might feel sad, but they won't really understand why. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, so I, I think um, it's important for us to probably answer this question, what is empathy, um, so that we can figure out what is psychopathy. So what do you guys think? What, what is the definition of empathy? I think we kind of just uh, got into it a bit. There's emotional empathy, which is when you feel the emotion of someone else or yeah, it's when you feel the emotion of someone else. And there's cognitive empathy, which is when you can develop like a conscious understanding of their emotions. Yeah. So, so what does it mean to, to feel the emotion of somebody else? Like, so the person is feeling an emotion and then they make a facial expression or something like that. And then that causes you to feel the exact same emotion. Is that right? Yeah. Maybe not the exact same emotion, but like if you see someone who is sad, it will trigger sadness within you. Yeah, and like there's mirror, the same neurons in the brain will tend to light up. A similar set, subset. Ariel, how familiar are you with the mirror neurons? Is that something that you could talk about a little bit? Because I think that's important to this discussion. And the basic idea of mirror neurons is that when, when, when you observe someone, basically when you observe someone doing something, then similar neurons light up in your brain as when you do it yourself. So if I was watching Chris play the piano and he did a brain scan on each of us, his piano playing circuits would be more greatly lit up, but mine would be also lit up to a certain extent or a subset of them would be lit up. And so mirror neurons are pretty essential to understanding empathy because it's the same idea is like, you know, if Chris was crying hysterically for whatever reason and I was a person with empathy, then... Um, I wouldn't have as many sadness neurons lit up, but I would have a large subset of them lit up. So that was a really interesting example, the, the example of playing a piano and then uh, watching somebody playing a piano and having the same neurons light up. Because what that suggests is that you, ha- you kind of have to have the same experiences as the other person in order to, f- to have those, the same neurons light up. Somebody who was watching me play the piano who had never played a piano before would probably not have that experience, right? Yeah, that's probably accurate. It might have a neurons light up corresponding to what they imagine piano playing was like, or maybe if there was some other task, it's like, like, let's say like, um, I was watching you, uh, let's say you were eating mayonnaise and you were like pretending that you were really enjoying it. Maybe I might think you were eating ice cream and like the parts of my brain that were associated with sweet might light up. So it's not like, I'm not necessarily experiencing exactly what you're experiencing, but I'm experiencing your interpretation my interpretation of what you're experiencing. There's one crazy thing too. It's, it's, there's, there's stuff like if you imagine playing the guitar or if you imagine playing the piano or if you watch someone play the piano, like your skill at it actually does become better. Not as much as if you do it yourself, but there's an actual like, it's, it's, it's pretty, the effects of mirror neurons are pretty substantial actually. Okay. One, one other thing about mirror neurons that's pretty interesting, I think, and relevant to this discussion is it seems like there's an association between child abuse and less development of mirror neurons. I would imagine that it was like, uh, it, it's a bimodal distribution, actually. That would be my guess. Because I would suspect that a lot of people who experience child abuse ha- are hyper empathetic, have overdeveloped mirror neurons. So it might be like on average, because that's the thing with averages, you don't actually know if it's not, doesn't necessarily correspond to a curve. But right. I would imagine that there's a bimodal distribution where there's like a, a hump at like low empathy and a hump at high empathy. For children of abuse. Right, exactly. If you're, if you're living in close proximity for many years to somebody who's very abusive, then you're going to learn exactly all of their triggers. You're going to learn what sets them off and you're going to learn very well how to, how to avoid setting them off. 
Um, and so, yeah, probably what happens is you have a very strong mirror neuron response and then you, you, well, you either can't control it or you somehow learn to control your reaction to that, that mirror neuron firing. It, well, it's like, there, there would be multiple strategies. Uh, one strategy for dealing with a chaotic and violent abusive person would be to become very empathetic towards that person and, and learn to maneuver around their emotions and you would really feel what they were feeling in, in order to use your empathy to help guide you through that horrible situation. Another strategy or adaptation, quote unquote, would be to detach and cognitively understand what's going on with them, but to learn to disassociate from experiencing any emotion based on the swings of their emotions. I mean, another thing that the book discusses is how when psychopaths raise children, they often use the strategy of they'll they'll pick the the child that has the most psychopathic tendencies and then sort of train, encourage the psychopathy in that child. And they'll often do that by using the less psychopathic child as like a scapegoat. So you call it golden child and scapegoat. So the golden child is always getting uh, praise and being encouraged for being like clever and um, for being successfully manipulative and for being dominant and all these things. And like the, the scapegoat child will get all, all the crap. And so often the scapegoat child and the scapegoat child like can't do anything right. And it's just kind of the punching bag. And so often the scapegoat child will grow up to be like hyper empathetic and like doormatty and will associate like psychopathic abuse with love and the golden child will grow up to be a psychopath. Well, it does raise an interesting question because if these psychopaths are devoid of empathy and the, and these other things, which are very human, why do they care about continuing their line like that? Or is it something just about, well, there are children here, better mess with them. Psychopaths tend to be very driven by success. It's not that they don't experience any emotions at all. They're still like, the glee and the excitement about winning and stuff like that. And they respond heavily to rewards though they don't tend to respond to punishments. So I would, I would think that having a child who was like you and continuing down your line would be a very selfish kind of reward. It wouldn't necessarily be about empathetic happiness and seeing that child succeed. Okay. And it's I like a narcissistic was- thing. Like I'm going to craft this child in my image. Well, Good well, psychopaths, psychopaths tend to see their children as extensions of themselves. So probably the psychopath would see the psychopathic child as just like a limb. Well, and, and the other thing is that it, it, it seems to be that it's kind of the similar idea of the selfish gene where, you know, basically you're a slave to your genes. Your genes are, tr- are all trying to reproduce and, and, you know, propagate themselves. And so, uh, you know, whether you, whether you like it or not, uh, that's what you're doing as you're pl- as you're playing out your life. You are <laughs> trying to get all of your genes to propagate as much as possible. So what Hinchin says is psychopaths are trying to propagate their psychopath genes because they have these special psychopath genes. I guess I would just say I, I don't know. I'm I'm a little bit skeptical about how much the specific psychopathic gene cluster has an impact on trying to replicate itself over other genes, but it, it's possible. I mean, another reason why maybe I could see children of abuse having lower empathy is like one thing that was interesting in like um, the James Fallon book where he, a uh, psychopath within is the psychopath inside. He talks about how when he was like 12, he had this period where he was like hyper empathetic and then he, the empathy just went away and never came back. And I thought that was just, that always kind of stuck with me. It seemed like an interesting detail that that could happen. Maybe this is sort of an unrelated thing, but I could sort of see like, um, I feel like actually myself, like as I feel like I'm a pretty empathetic person, but in a lot of times in my life, I've sort of like put up walls where I've like, just sort of like not engaged with people emotionally very much because it's like, it's almost like unpleasantly overwhelming or it, it it's very like distracting or like it's easy to get into like bad situations. So just... I'll just like put up walls and just focus on myself and my own, my own little world and, or just like very safe people. So maybe that could be, I feel like there's almost something between like, um, like high empathy, high empathy can almost lead to like low empathy behaviors. Mm. I I think that 
um, when Ann Hinchins makes this point that everybody has the ability to, you know, to not feel empathy for, or, or to, I guess, maybe ignore their empathy for certain people that they consider, you know, in the out group. Um, he, the example he uses is, you know, think about, you know, uh, you know, maybe a, a young child relative or something like that, that you have a lot of affection for. And then it's like, okay, now think about, you know, some random stranger on the street, you know, like trying to, trying to get you to give, give them money. And he goes there, you know, you just switch the empathy switch in your brain. Um, so I, I think all humans have the ability to, to switch off or, or disregard the empathy that they have for certain people. Because if we didn't have that ability, then we would constantly be, um, uh, I mean, it would just, <laughs> we, we, we'd waste all of our time caring for all of the people in trouble and we would never care for ourselves basically. Um, well, that's, that's part of the point of like Buddhism, right? Like that's why like those skill the skills of non-attachment and love go together in the Buddhist model because it's like, you're supposed to like be able to like feel empathy for all people in the world. And like, that's like, um, that's like enlightenment when you're able to do that and just like, have it just like flow through you and like not get like bothered and attached to fixing it and stuff like that. Right. And I think there's a, a sort of process by, uh, whereby you can cultivate empathy um, and be able to include more and more and more people in, in your personal in-group um, potentially until it, that encompasses all of humanity or all of life as, as you just mentioned that it does in, in enlightenment. Yeah, like empathy is a empathy is empathy is a talent and a skill. Like John Verbeke says that empathy is morally neutral. You know, like compassion is the virtue because compassion is when you act on the empathy. But empathy itself can be used for either virtuous or unvirtuous means. So like he gives the example of like let's say you're a highly empathetic person and you go into a room and you immediately sense that there's like people are afraid and there's danger. You can just use that empathetic knowledge to just run away and act cowardly. So it's like empathy doesn't necessarily empathy doesn't necessarily make you a better person. Right. And empathy on the flip side can also be very destructive, as in the case of like a, a mama bear protecting her cub. She's feeling much a lot of empathy for her cub and she sees a threat. And so she destroys the, the threat with all necessary force. And I think one could maybe argue that that's what... Uh, <laughs> you know, some of these, some of these horrible dictators uh, were doing, maybe they felt a lot of empathy for their people. And, and so that, that drove them to do horrible things to their out group. One question I had that just sort of came up when I was doing some reading this morning was like, so he, Peter Hinchin talks about how like psychopaths are likely to be paranoid because everyone, because people hate psychopaths basically. But he also talks about how, how psychopaths are supposed to be without fear. And I don't really understand how those two things can be together because it seems to me that paranoia is a type of fear i don't see paranoia as a type of fear or maybe paranoia is like cognitive fear or you could say something like that like paranoia to me is when i'm thinking a lot about everything that could possibly going could possibly be going wrong and i'm very suspicious but fear is when your body is filled with like this reactive emotion that drives you to one of fight or flee. Yeah, I think what Hinchins would probably say is that paranoia is not an emotion. It's just a sort of a, a default mode of operation. It does make Hitler seem psychopathic because he was pretty paranoid, but probably didn't experience much fear. Well, so we were talking about how can we identify who's, who's, a, who's a psychopath and who isn't, and it does seem like there's an overlap between psychopathy or... Um, if you interpret psychopathy as a mental illness, then you can say that it's roughly equivalent to antisocial personality disorder in the DSM, that this is often comorbid or, or looks like, if you're trying to diagnose somebody, it looks like um, potentially a whole bunch of other conditions. So some of the other disorders in the DSM that you find are histrionic, borderline, and narcissistic personality disorder. Um, and then there's also autism, you know, people who just find it hard to relate to other people, but they don't have any um, malevolence, as it were. Um, Asperger's, I guess, is just a mild form of autism. Uh, and then there's what Hinchins calls the natural leader, 
which, you know, is somebody who has these kind of like this forceful personality uh, and, 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 you know, and, and pushes people and inspires people and, and, and maybe very charismatic, um, but again, doesn't have the kind of lack of empathy and maybe they even have more empathy than average. I'm curious about the, this natural leader idea. So I guess it's, it relates to the idea of a psychopathic CEO. So maybe there are people who, who are CEOs, but they're not all the way psychopaths, but they do have the hard edge that's necessary to make difficult decisions. Like firing people is not easy. And I think you do need to, or one way to deal with it is to turn off your empathy when you're firing people. Like you're not going to think, oh, this guy's going to be without a job and how is he going to feed his family? Just have to make the clean incision. I don't know. I mean, I sort of think that like a truly great leader would maintain empathy even when doing the difficult thing and just live with the difficult emotion of empathy, live with the difficult emotions that empathy brings up. And Yeah, I think, Kurt, you're pointing out a, a, a situation in, in which compassion might be like acting on the empathy might be the wrong decision. So it's like you can still feel empathy, but you're not driven by your empathy or you're not completely controlled by your empathy. Right. I, ideally, I think that's the way that you would want to be. You would be, want to be able to take in the information of empathy and connect with other people in that way and then still act and make difficult decisions when necessary. But I think you're right, Kurt. Like, I think that's a lot of the reason why you see psychopaths overrepresented in CEO roles is because it's a lot easier to not act empathetically if you're not empathetic. <laughs> and I mean, that's arguably the result of like the moral failing of normal people who maybe are, are almost uh, trapped by their emotions and not able to act the way they need to. Like, I mean, a boss that like doesn't fire a bunch of like bad actors or incompetent people and just lets the company go under and then everyone loses their job like that person isn't acting morally they're just a weak leader right well i can think of a similar situation where somebody really knows they need to break up with their partner but they're afraid that it's going to hurt them so much that's a that's a big one i think a lot of people myself included sometimes hang on to relationships much longer than it's healthy to do so and then up hurting people more than if you'd cut it clean early on. And, and it's those kinds of behaviors, like both the relationship, staying in a relationship um, that's dysfunctional or holding on to employees that are dysfunctional. Like those relationships are what allow psychopaths to outcompete nor normal people is when people give into their emotions like that and don't do what needs to be done. Yeah. It's almost like when you're, when you're firing somebody is kind of like when you're breaking up with somebody and yeah, that has happened to me where I've, I've let a relationship go on longer than it should have. And then uh, in subsequent relationships, I, I realized that maybe the same thing was happening. And so I ended it early. And I think, I think it's useful to think, well, because I have empathy for this person, because I don't want to hurt them, I'd much rather end this, this earlier, because that'll actually cause them less pain in the, in the long run. So I think maybe when you're firing somebody, you can, you can be thinking that as well. Like, well, you know, this, this relationship is just not going well. And so I might as well fire this person now. And although it's causing them pain now, it's actually saving them pain, the, the, the pain that they would have if I just, if I kept them on for longer and longer. I think this brings up an interesting question. Like Hinchins in, in his book, he, it seems like he sees the world in a way where a lot of, or maybe the majority of the world's problems are caused by these psychopathic, unempathetic, bad actors who have weaseled their way in. But this is maybe an example of where, normal people or social people are causing a lot of problems. Uh, how, how much do you think that the world's, the world's problems are caused by psychopaths versus regular people not managing their emotions well? That's a great question. I, I, I do think that probably a significant portion of the world's pain and troubles can be attributed to normal social humans just being incompetent <laughs> uh, or not emotionally intelligent. You can't totally lay the blame of uh, human evil at the feet of any of those things that have been mentioned so far. It's a very complex problem that, cause that has a lot of different psychological roots. Uh, I tend to believe that 
it's like Solzhenitsyn said, the line between good and evil passes through each human being. And I tend to believe that the main way we can improve or a major way we can improve the world is to improve ourselves and to encourage other um, non-psychopathic people to self-improve. And that might involve um, being able to uh, detect and contain bad actors in various ways. It probably does. Like not being naive is a, is a virtue, but definitely psychopaths do a lot of damage as well. I want I wanted to bring up something that I was thinking about because as I was reading through this book again, thinking about our, our pre- some of our previous episodes that we've done on masculinity versus femininity, um, I, I noticed that you know as we said, a lot of these more psychopathic or these traits of psychopaths tend to be also traits that you that you would want in a good leader, and some of those traits. Um, or a lot of those traits, I would say, are associated with being masculine. So what do you guys think about the connection between psychopathy and masculinity? Yeah, so this is kind of a an interesting one. I think there is a connection. I don't know how well worked out I have this in my mind yet, but a, a lot of things that I associate with masculinity also like kind of a stoic attitude towards fear and, and difficult things seem like they would be na- very natural to a psychopath. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that, and and I think that you know if if we if we believe Hinchinson's model that that you know we have th- that human beings have these fifty or so emotions, and that psychopaths have nine of them, the predator emotions. You know, it it does seem that you know all of these emotions exist for a reason because they evolved because they were useful in some way, and it seems like the predator emotions, and this is something that Hinchins doesn't say. It seems like the predator emotions are actually useful for things like war, for things like yeah. <laughs> destroying the outgroup. Um, and it further seems to me that uh, men were traditionally the ones who had to go and fight. And so while the, the, the motivations for war might be more defensive, um, I think the actual act of going out and destroying your enemy requires these kind of sort of fury and bloodlust and all that kind of stuff. You know, Hinchins talks about that, uh, you know, the way that the military functions is it basically trains young men how to be psychopathic killers and that that's actually useful for the society that is being protected by that military. So I guess that's, you know, obviously a controversial thing to say. And especially, you know, nowadays it seems like we should try to find peaceful solutions to things, but it certainly seems that, that these emotions and these, these associations evolved for a, for a reason, for a good reason. Yeah, on that point, I remember seeing the, the, these two interviews that were edited together and they were asking the same questions of these veterans. And one of them was a, a veteran, I think, from some war like the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and he was drafted. And so his his answers were all like, well, it was, you know, it was terrible. It was awful and we, we had to do these things to, to other people and to survive and everything. And the other fellow joined the military voluntarily and he'd done like a couple of tours in Iraq or something like that. And the way he talked about it was like, it was just awesome. And, you know, there's a fantastic and you just go in there and everything's powerful. And it is like that glee of being a predator that Hinchins is talking about. I mean, it's important to note that Hinchins also warns against associating psychopathy too closely with violence. He says it's sort of like a common prejudice, but that psychopaths prefer to use nonviolent tactics like manipulation and lies and cheating and to stay under under the radar. And it's only really like dysfunctional psychopaths or psychopaths who are sort of stuck, trapped in a corner who will resort to overt violence. If, if you can go to war and get away with violence... Maybe that's something that they do. Right, exactly. I think he, sa- he says that the reason why they tend to avoid violence is because in today's society, you get punished and caught if you are violent. But if you are in the military and you're a psychopath, that's probably, you know, like a, you know, all you can eat buffet for you. And uh, another thing related to that, uh, they say a lot of psychopaths end up in prison. And the reason th- is because a, a lot of them can't necessarily think things out pragmatically or plan ahead and think about, well, what if I get caught for this? So the ones that are out in society, 
tend to be these ones who will avoid violence and seek seek other m- means of manipulation. But a lot of psychopaths are actually in prison because they they can't necessarily control their violent urges or they they don't even think to control them. Yeah, it's estimated that about twenty five percent of violent criminals in prison are psychopaths. It, it's possible that psychopathy appears equally in both genders, but that uh, with men, violence is simply a better strategy than it is with women from a man than from a woman. Yeah. I mean, I think that as we were saying in our masculinity episode, that both men and women have masculine and feminine aspects of their, of their personalities. And, and so, um, and of course, Hinchin's talks about the, the, the character that he uses for the psychopath throughout the story is called Mallory. And he chooses that name because it's, um, it can be either male or female, and it's typically used in uh, analysis of the security of computer systems to talk about, you know, Mallory being this hacker who's trying to hack into your system. Uh, and so, so this Mallory character is kind of this gender fluid, you know, like it doesn't really matter whether the person is a man or a woman. Um, but it does still seem to me that, and, and of course, you know, he, t- he even goes into the details of, well, this is what a male psychopath looks like. They'll, 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 you know, they'll really hammer these specific sexual triggers for women and women will, you know, they'll be drawn to it like a, like a moth to the flame, you know, and there's, and there's, you know, nothing they can do to fight it. And the same thing with female psychopaths, um, they will, they will exaggerate these things that, that, you know, men are looking for in a sexual partner. Um, and so those things are different, but it, it's, it still seems to me that, uh, the, the female psychopaths using those, uh, those strategies to try and sort of ensnare their prey it seems like they're, those those female psychopaths are using kind of a, a masculine strategy. So during this conversation, I've just been looking up estimates and it's kind of hard to know because psychopathy is controversial. It's tough to study, but I've been finding that basically everyone who studied it and estimated it thinks that there's way, that the prevalence of psychopathy is much higher in men than in women, like in some cases up to 20 to one or some cases more like two to one. So it's really tough to know, but I thought that was an interesting question. Ariel, do you think that the prevalence is actually higher in men or just that men's behavior would be more likely to cause them to be recognized as psychopaths? I have no idea. I mean, I'm not really arguing there's gender parity between male and female psychopaths because I have no idea. I'm just sort of trying to present the idea that there is a counter argument to what you guys are saying. But I mean, the counter argument that Hinchins would say is that male psychopaths are just more recognized because their psychopathy often takes the form of activities that our society labels as criminal, whereas female psychopaths wouldn't, so they would fall into the radar more frequently. So there's, there's this simple counter-argument to that. I thought it was interesting in the book where he, he suggests that psychopathy, like for most of the book, he, he uses the metaphor of psychopaths as predators, but at one point he suggests that psychopathy might just be, one way of looking at it is as a third gender. It is a psychopaths follow a completely different pattern of sexual behavior than most people, according to Peter Hinchins. Yeah, I was thinking about that too, because it's like, if you see people as objects, if you make no real distinction between people and objects, then it makes sense that it wouldn't concern you where you get your rocks off, because you could, you could go anywhere. Uh, it's, it doesn't really matter. Right, yeah. Hinchins basically says psychopaths even even tend to be sort of have like these fluid genders or these kind of um kind of be bisexual and and not yeah not not have uh like a specific gender preference uh because and and they do this to maximize whatever their strategy is so each psychopath is going to have a you know a different strategy based on whatever their strengths are and so their sexual preferences are going to become aligned to whatever that strategy is. Is that true? Is there documented evidence that psychopaths are more likely to be bisexual or pansexual? My, my guess is that that's just Peter Hinchins <laughs> uh, guessing that. I, there might be. Uh, I'd be fascinated to, to see if there's been studies on that. Yeah, I, I don't know if psychopathy would interfere with your sexual arousal. And like what causes sexual arousal, maybe. Well, if you get turned on by power. I know that psychopaths are more likely to be promiscuous. I think that also relates to the, the, the idea that psychopaths aren't necessarily good at assessing risk. 
Apparently, there is a study that bisexual women tend to have elevated traits of sociosexuality and psychopathic traits. I don't know what sociosexuality means. It means you have sex with entire societies. Oh, sex outside of a committed relationship. Oh, okay. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> and LGBT people are more likely to have personality disorders. I already knew that. There's a lot of ways to interpret. There's a lot of ways to interpret that. Yeah. There's a lot of potential causes for that correlation. It's not just because they're still going by DSM one, right? No. No, they they're going by the <laughs> which I'm just DSM. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just it's a 2011 study. No. Never mind. We're on four, right? DSM. Is DSM one the one that has five. like like homosexuality as a mental disorder or something? Yes. Yes. No, no. This is an actual study. Like it's it's well known though that L- LGBT people are more likely to have personality disorders. That's like a sure. well known finding. Yeah, sure. I think intimate partner violence is actually highest in lesbian relationships too, higher than heterosexual relationships or gay relationships. Yeah, all the stats on inter. Inter, that's the thing like you, you say these stats and and they're like accepted but you kind of got to break them down a bit to some to some extent because like the stats around intimate partner violence are really weird because yeah there's, there's different um there's different ways that they measure it and then you get completely different correlations depending on how they measure it that makes sense and also like the first thing i think of there is that not that it's okay but like violence between women is a little bit lower stakes if you're counting things like slaps or or something like that, as opposed to a relationship where there's a huge strength differential between partners. I can see how it could become more likely. Well, I I haven't really looked into lesbian violence too much, but in terms of um, male and female violence, there's a lot of controversy as to whether male violence against women is more common. Male intimate partner violence is more common than female intimate partner violence. Because when they ask people, when they when they use the conflict scale, which is when they call people and they're like, "Have you hit your partner in the past twelve months? Have you thought about hitting your partner? Have you thrown an object in a conflict?" Then you get about parity between men and women, and so a lot of like people will look at that and say like, "Women are just as likely to be violent as men." When they do stuff like they look at um, stuff that's reported, or they look at like injuries from intimate partner violence, or when they take into account stuff like. Um, context factors like level of fear that the person experiencing violence is experiencing, the level of trauma that comes, the violence is systematic and persistent, uh, the injuries caused, physical injuries, it's overwhelmingly worse when it goes in the male to female direction, worse and more common. So it's uh, there's a lot of controversy around that and it's very politicized. Yeah, I think if you look at specifically the I was thinking, you know, stats about domestic violence must be, must necessarily come from like reports to the police about domestic violence, but you're right. You can just call people up and interview them. So, uh, but if you're looking I, I, at- I just, I just explained there's different ways that they measure it. Like when they do, like the justice department does really stats right, about the number that are reported, like you just said, but the, the conflict scale studies have been going on for a while and they're a big source of data now. Right. Yeah. So it seems to me that if you're, if you're just looking at the reports of domestic violence, then you know, you're, you're looking at uh, not only cases where, where there's visible abuse, you know, where there's basically something that can be confirmed, you know, by like an injury, like blood or, or a bruise or something like that. Um, and, but also that the person is willing to report it. So, uh, yeah, I, I feel like that would probably skew towards, uh, towards male and female and away from sort of... I mean, I mean you like can argue... You can argue that there's skew on both sides. Like that's what people say is like the men are afraid of reporting so they don't report, which maybe is true. And there's also stuff like some people criticize like the self-report studies and that like a woman is more, they say women are more likely to be like, oh yeah, I slapped him. I'm so terrible. Whereas like a man who actually like was a batterer would deny it often or you get situations like because they ask, have you been hit? Have you hit? So like someone like OJ Simpson called himself like a battered husband. So if OJ Simpson received that call for the survey of the self-report study, he might be like, deny all his own violence and be like, oh yeah, she slapped me. It's really bad. So so it, they're skewed. It's, if you, there, there might be skew either way. It's hard to know what's really going on. 
Yeah, there's different ways to look at it. And another thing that I think is important to like look at is what's the percentage of people who end up like killed by intimate partners and that's overwhelmingly women killed by men. Yeah, and there's different ways to interpret that too because, I mean, you could say, well, women are overwhelmingly the ones injured by intimate partner violence, both psychologically and physically, but that might just be because men are stronger. So it's like, you know, women are kind of bringing a knife to a gunfight kind of thing when it comes to um, physical battles or you might say that there's some kind of, you know, you can can invoke um, the oppression of women, you can invoke... uh, all kinds of, you can invoke archetypes, you can invoke all kinds of different sorts of factors that can cause those differences. So it's hard to know what's really going on, which isn't to say we shouldn't try to figure out what's going on, but it's just complicated. And I suspect that a lot of these issues, like LGBT people having higher rates of personality disorders, like I haven't broken it down the way that I have that particular issue, uh, because I don't know, but I'm sure if you did break it down and you followed the trail of studies and possible explanations, it starts to become very complicated too. Like everything kind of does. So, Ariel, uh, you mentioned O.J. O. Simpson. Do we want to speculate about who might be a, fa- a famous psychopath? It's really hard to say with O.J. Simpson. I was like, I was actually thinking about that because I just watched uh, the documentary with, uh, you know, when I was sick, I watched the documentary with my dad and my brother. It's hard to say because he definitely seemed to experience jealousy, which Peter Hinchin said that psychopaths don't. But, but I mean, I was thinking like the, the whole thing that happened, like it's terrible to talk about, but like even like that he was like, like the day, like the day that he killed her, he was like, it was extremely predatory. Like he was like fixated on her, and then he he basically stalked her down at her house, and like all that, like that whole range of emotion. I could just, I was actually thinking about O.J. Simpson killing her while I was reading, while he was describing the emotions of a predator. But it's hard to say because again, it's like not that psychopaths are able to go in the role, mode of a predator. It's that the mode of a predator is the only mode they're able to be in. But it does seem like there's something. Anyway, also, I should probably say allegedly killed her. Um, allegedly saw, killed her. We don't actually know for sure what happened. Well, he was proven right. innocent in a court of law, wasn't he? So, like, I, don't, I don't know about O.J. Simpson, but have any of you guys watched the, the recent Netflix series on Ted Bundy? I read the Anne Rule book about him. Okay. So when I, when I was watching that series and, and reading a bit about Ted Bundy, he seemed like the most to the letter example of a psychopath that I've ever seen. He was highly charismatic. He seemed to not empathize with his victims and very much contextualize them like, like prey. Uh, And he was seen as a a very upstanding member of the community, but was able to do horrific things without any kind of visible remorse or emotional disturbance from it. One, one thing about Ted Bundy that's interesting is um, early in his life, when he was in college, he, he met this woman who he was, who was like obsessed with and they dated and she broke up with him. And he, he went on, he, he became like this successful guy. He came back because basically she broke up with him because he wasn't success, successful enough. So he went out, became more successful, came back, won her back. They were dating and then he dumped her. It was some kind of test of his own abilities or like like he, like it was all fake which parts were fake as in him getting trying to win her over and everything that was fake like he yeah, didn't him, really yeah, care yeah, he, he basically he basically like turned himself into like the ideal man so that he could win her back and so that he could like sort of prove to himself that he could do it and then he just broke up with her it's probably something that's gone through a lot of people's minds like i'm gonna win this person back just to show, <laughs> maybe not, you know, hardly anybody would actually go through with it. But yeah, I it's, think it's, there are some different. people. It's, who, yeah. it's completely different though, because normal people have thoughts of revenge yeah. and it's different motivation. How it's so? Different, well, if someone's going through revenge, then it's like, that's, that's like a, a more normal emotion, even though it can be very dysfunctional because it's like you're wanting to punish them for a perceived bad behavior. So it's like, they dumped me and broke my heart. I'll sh- someday I'll dump them and break their heart. It's completely like that. Like that's a basic emotion of revenge. But what Ted Bundy did was he, he wasn't actually trying to get revenge on her. He was trying to see if he could become the man who could a- attract her. He was just, it was like a, he was testing his own abilities. 
Right. It was all a game to him. Yeah. And then afterwards, they say all the women he killed looked like her. Like he 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 picked out women that looked like that woman who who he was obsessed with in college. Well, it does sound more like it was something to do with revenge. Then it does sound more human than than just this game. I don't know. It doesn't seem like it was revenge. It seems like it was more like it does seem like it was more like obsession. Okay. Obsession, obsession, and like feeding a hunger. It doesn't seem to me that it was. It was motivated. What he did was motivated by revenge. But why the obsession? If he didn't want to get revenge, where does the obsession come from? What's the seed? Well, that's that's sort of the question with all psychopaths because all psychopaths want something. All psychopaths have a primary motivation, as as do we all to a certain extent. But it's like some psychopaths seem motivated by money and comfort, which seems to be like what Hitchens focuses on. But other psychopaths seem motivated by like uh, sex or a desire for power. It it seems like there's multiple possible primary motivations for psychopaths. So uh, So it's 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 kind of like they're these these one note players. Like they can they can only play a couple of notes when it comes to motivation. So, so Hinchins actually says that revenge is one of the primary emotions and it's a social emotion. Um, and so he claims that psychopaths do not feel the emotion of revenge. He defines it as the emotion of punishing a rule breaker. You feel anger at first, then you feel determined and justified in action, even if that means violence. And then it says you show neither happiness nor sadness. You tense the muscles around your eyes, uh, et cetera. It says revenge can lead to the predator emotions if the emotion spreads to a group. Yeah, so I'm not totally convinced that all serial killers are psychopaths. Right. You're saying they're like some sort of vampires, like an emotional vampires, like that they're, they're trying to evoke the emotions that make them feel satisfied somehow. I do remember reading one interview with some serial killer and somebody asked him, Well, just how did you do that? Like, didn't you feel sorry for these people that you're attacking or something? And he did say, Yeah, of course. That's why I just switched off my empathy which is interesting because supposedly you know a a psychopath doesn't have empathy so this guy was something else he actually had different motivations to a psychopath and different brain structure or something yeah i actually um i was watching these interviews with ed kemper there's a really good song actually about him by Talos called See Me. And it's it's basically from the perspective of Ed Kemper as a child and how he like becomes all messed up. But he didn't seem to me like he was a psychopath. Like he was a serial killer, but he was like, he had this like horrible relationship with his mother. And he like basically killed all these women. And in his mind, he was like killing his mother. And then the end, he killed his mother and then turned himself in. And I don't know, it just, it seemed like there was something else going on besides, I mean, he probably was someone with very low empathy or very dysfunctional empathy, but it's weird yes. to talk about. Like, who knows? Who knows? Because it's like someone can, you know, be a psychopath and kill a bunch of people and then pretend to have empathy. And it's hard to know what's really going on with people. But. Yeah. So I, w- what Hinchin says is, you know, if, if somebody is, is violent and a serial killer, yeah, they, they, they might be a psychopath, but they, yeah, they probably have something else entirely going, something else uh, going on entirely. Um, the, the, the important thing to remember about Hinchin's theory is that the, the psychopath is a parasite and so they can't kill their host. <laughs> you know, they have to, you know, I mean, eventually they might like use up their host and they'll have to go seek some other host. But if they can just kind of sit there and like feed and be parasitical for a while, um, then that's much more adaptive uh, in evolutionary terms. It seems like one of the eternal problems of human societies is how to control bad actors, how to, how to make sure that bad actors don't get in and infect the system and bring it down. And so one of the ways that human societies have come up with dissolve this or the best way that we have is governments um, who are supposed to protect us from external threats as well as internal threats. Uh, Having been through sort of the libertarian and anarchist communities, this is definitely a big problem for them because, uh, well, of course, they don't believe in government. And so there must be some mechanism for detecting and punishing bad actors. 
how do we think that relates to the psychopathy discussion? It's, it's tough because on the one hand, if you set up a government, like some kind of a structure that gets to run everything and in almost a very direct sense, get be parasitical, be parasitic towards the, the community through taxation, it's like a psychopath magnet, you know, it's the, it's the perfect structure for a psychopath to go into kind of live out their natural psychology. But on the other hand, if you don't have some kind of institutionalized arbiter of force, then when there is a bad actor in the community, nobody really knows what to do. Nobody has automatic authority. And I I mean, having been through libertarian and anarchist communities as well, I think we can think of some examples where that, that happened. You know, there were people who were violent or making violent threats and because there was no belief in, in using the state, it was a very difficult problem to solve. People were reluctant to report to police and vigilante justice was probably not a good (laughs) alternative either. Yeah. Well, I guess the key example is about what goes down in Agapulco, but it's also, I mean, even if you weren't so ideological that you were willing to go to cops, well, then the cops in Acapulco aren't necessarily going to do anything to to help you. Are you guys comfortable telling that story of what happened in Acapulco? Yeah, that's going to be weird just having a, a hanging reference to it like that. <laughs> sure. There, there, there's a podcast about it. Sure. Yeah. So you can look this up too on, I think it was Thaddeus Russell did a, did a podcast about this whole incident. Uh, there was a, a man who went by the name of Paul Propert who was a war vet and, you know, suffered from PTSD as well as many other things. There were a lot of reports and claims of him making violent threats against multiple people in in the community through new messages uh, in in person, things of that nature. I mean, uh, I, I can attest that I saw a lot of, unhinged, uh, scary seeming Facebook posts <laughs> coming from his page. Uh, there was a, a screenshot going around that, you know, you never know, but there, there was a screenshot going around of conversation with him where he, he was talking about having created schematics of, of someone's home and he reports that he had possibly planted bombs in someone's home and, and things of that nature. And when there there actually ended up being a a murder in Acapulco and uh, some people or many people believe that he may have had something to do with it, whether directly or, or indirectly. But the, the, the point here for me was like with all this going on that the community or, or, or no one really knew what to do. You know, but most of the people down there were very ideologically anarchist. And so they, they weren't going to go to the police and, you know, in Acapulco is going to the police even going to help you. That's a whole nother question. But, but yeah, I, I think that is an area where typically governments step in and, and perhaps there are, there are other solutions, but it was, it was certainly quite jarring to see something like that play out in a, community that feels very strongly that that governments are not necessary. Yeah, and I think the important thing is that, you know, there was a murder and uh, there didn't seem to be anybody who could do anything about it. Um, And, you know, it's kind of like in the Wild West of the United States, you know, there was just, yeah, just rampant murder until... Somebody came up and said, somebody stepped up and said, I'm the sheriff <laughs> and I will track down the murderers. And, you know, maybe some of them did a good job and maybe some of them didn't. But uh, it seems like the the stable state of human societies is somebody being the sheriff. So it's whittling of note that a lot of intentional communities, when they begin, they'll try to create some kind of dispute resolution process. And in Acapulco, 
people started moving to Acapulco as uh, libertarians and anarchists, and they didn't think too much about that stuff because it's it's not really organized at all. It's just a bunch of in, individuals, and of course, it's, it's a very individual individualistic ideology. So that was far from the mind. But if somebody is is going to do this kind of project, and there are a lot of these types of project around the world, that's something to to think about from the beginning. And when there are bad actors, how are you going to deal with them? What people are you going to bring in to resolve or arbitrate? I mean, even those those communities that set up systems like transformative justice or restorative justice, like there's a lot of problems with them too. Like the big thing now is to be like criticizing those systems because they often don't work very well. Or, I, I mean, I have yet to see a system of dispute resolution that works as well as, sad to say, a criminal justice system and the institution of a trial by jury. Yeah, so I mean, an important point here is maybe restorative justice and dispute resolution would work well for most people or for most social people, but those who believe in psychopathy generally say that it's not treatable. So it, there's restorative justice talking through the problem just wouldn't work <laughs> if you were dealing with a psychopath. It, it often makes it worse because the psychopath is really good at gaming the system of like transformative or restorative justice and can often like manipulate the group into, you know, just still feeding them in some way, even if they're the one who's like, you know, the target of that kind of, those kinds of processes. Right, exactly. What, what Hinchins would say is that they would, they would simply learn how to not get caught again um, because they're, they're so good at that. That's the skill that they're best at. And so, you know, it's adaptive for them to continue ignoring the emotions of other people and just pretend like they're following the rules and then continue to break the rules. Uh, or, if they, or if they are caught breaking the rules, they come up with whatever to make themselves the victim or to like, get in power again. Like if it's like a, like a lot of these communities are like social justice communities. They'll talk about like being oppressed in some way and how their oppression is feeding into this dysfunctional behavior, how the other person, maybe they did a bad thing, but the other person was being like really racist or sexist or transphobic or whatever. Or they'll talk about like their trauma and it'll become all about their trauma. And sometimes they'll lie about having a trauma, they'll lie about being victimized by other people. Like, like if, that's why like these kinds of soft justice approaches like they they can be very easily gamed if someone is willing to um basically lie, cheat, steal, whatever and doesn't care about other people and doesn't care about a positive outcome. Like these systems only work under the assumption that everyone involved is like fundamentally invested in some ethical way in a positive outcome. I think that also a lot a lot of those two things do apply to criminal justice systems as well. So in the book, Hinchins talks about that. Like people ask, well, why don't you just go to the police? And the the victim of the abuser or the psychopath is in a tricky position because if they do go to the police, then the abuser will lie to the police and, and make something up. So it's like we don't yet have a system for dealing with these types of abuse. I mean, the criminal justice system typically sends violent psychopaths to prison with some regularity. And like, yes, people can lie. If two people, if two people are lying, it's hard to imagine any system other than one of total constant surveillance that can determine who is telling the truth. Maybe some kind of mind reading system. If two people, if it's he said, he said, she said to a very high degree, but I mean, the criminal justice system at least has a clear standard of rules that are very detailed. So it's like, and that take intentionality into account. So it's like, there's less wiggle room than with a lot of these like mediation, transformative justice type systems. Right. And, but at the same time, Hinchins notes that if, if it does boil down to a he said, he said, she said, situation with you and a psychopath, the psychopath is almost certainly going to win. That's their game. Their game is getting the, the neutral witnesses on their side. And he even says, I've seen, you know, I've seen uh, somebody who, who was being abused, who, who's, um, you know, being violently abused, call the police. 
And then within, within 30 seconds of arriving, the police is like berating the person who got abused because the psychopath made up some story, some lie. Yeah, but our criminal justice system also has the the um, presumption of innocence. So maybe the abused person will get, maybe the police will get taken in by the psychopath. But ultimately, at least in theory, and the criminal justice system is very flawed, extremely flawed. I don't want to minimize that. But at least the basic ideas behind it, there's a lot of really good ideas, like the presumption of innocence. Like if it truly is he said, she, he said, she said, and there is no other pieces of evidence, then the system is supposed to exonerate both people because there's not enough evidence to convict anyone beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah, that's an important thing to bring in is there's also things like DNA evidence and other ways other than just things that can be manipulated. But I mean, yeah, it's no system is going to be perfect against a highly skilled liar, a highly skilled charismatic liar. Yeah, and the O.J. Simpson trial might be a good example of when the criminal justice system did fall into a lot of those, those kinds of like a psychopathic strategy almost of diversion and lying and it may be victim mentality. Yeah. Oh, I, I wanted to bring up. I, I read an article a, a while back that was written by someone who worked in uh, the juvenile, ju- a juvenile facility, basically for the the worst juvenile offenders in their state. I believe it was in Wisconsin. And they said that a huge percentage of the kids that they were dealing with were, were psychopaths. And, and what they found in working with them was that they don't feel fear. They don't feel hurt by social exclusion. So they're basically immune against any punishment. They'll just see punishment as something that they can calculate it's whether or not it's it's worth it for them to go forward with their plan. You know, it's just a, a little bump in the road or it's like the price to pay for doing what you want to do. But they found that they were very, very responsive to rewards, like especially rewards that would give them things like money or status or extra privileges or, or, or things of that nature. And they said that they had some limited success into reforming these people into basically still psychopaths who had no empathy and, and, and didn't care about other people. But, but you, you could sometimes convince a psychopath that it was in their own best interest not to do things that were too horrible. And maybe that's the only route out. I knew someone once actually who kind of was a little bit like that. Like he didn't really seem to have any empathy or innate moral sense, but we would have these conversations a lot where I would sort of try to like um, convince him that being moral was like a good strategy as it ultimately produced results that were more in your best interest because you built your reputation. And then if you were just strictly honest all the time, you would end up with the best life and you just have sort of conversations like that. Never really seem convinced though. I think that's because it's probably not true. <laughs> like if your only goal is advantage for yourself, it's probably best to behave morally most of the time and then look out for opportunities that you can exploit where it's safe to act against that. I I think that's why we have morality uh, so that we, we, I think that's why we have a moral sense. It's, It's something that drives us to do the right thing, even when it's not in our best interest. This is some like a game theory things and it's like a game of poker where there's a really tight player and everybody knows he's the tightest knit at the table. And so every so often he can just pull off this egregious bluff and people will let him get away with it because they know his reputation. Well, this is, this is, this is the prisoner's dilemma, basically. You guys know the prisoner's dilemma? So basically the idea of the prisoner's dilemma is you have two criminals Um, They both get arrested and the police are trying to get each of them to rat on their partner. If they both rat on their partner, they both get eight years in prison. If they both keep their mouth shut, they both get one year in prison. If one rats on the other and the other keeps his mouth shut, the one who's like the sucker who kept his mouth shut gets 10 years and the one who ratted gets out right away and vice versa. So the basic idea is um, if both of them like stick together then they end up with the best overall situation because they each only get one year in prison and they're allowed out. Whereas if they both screw over the other one, they both get like a moderate amount of time in prison. 
but if one screws over the other one and the other one stays good, then the one who stays good is screwed and the one who is basically the asshole gets out scot-free. And what happens in the prisoner's dilemma is you end up with a Nash equilibrium where both, um, if everyone is acting in their own self-interest purely, then they both rat each other out and they both end up with a longer amount of time in prison. That's the Nash equilibrium. So that sort of explains why altruism is given this like extra sort of force in our emotions because the optimal outcome for both people is if they both keep their mouth shut. Well, and I think an important uh, aspect of that decision also is how much do you trust the other person? So, you know, if there's some random stranger that you were doing something with, then you probably don't trust them very much. And so you probably can guess that they're going to try and screw you over. But if you're like brothers, then it it seems much more likely that they're not going to screw you over. And so your best strategy is to uh, not rat them out. Yeah. And that's where the natural equilibrium changes. If you as the natural equilibrium is basically where you end up. It's a stable point where you everything ends up if everyone acts in their own self-interest. So if you have multiple iterations of the prisoner's dilemma, like if the prisoners are going to be arrested and questioned every week, let's say, then the Nash equilibrium ends up worth where they both keep their mouth shut. So if there's like a reputation system or some kind of ongoing relationship, then people become altruistic. But it, it also explains the incentive to be a psychopath because it's true that if you're if you're able to like sort of find a situation where you can screw over other people and make off with everything, then it's in your interest to do so if you're purely interested in yourself and don't care about the larger system. Yeah. So, I mean, the interesting thing about the prisoner's dilemma is the interesting thing about the prisoner's dilemma is in both cases, whether your partner rats you out or doesn't rat you out, you're better off if you betray them. Like even your partner rats you out, you're better off if you rat them out as well, because then you'll both get the the eight year sentence or whatever it is. And given that your partner doesn't rat you out, you're better off if you rat them out because then you get zero years and they get the 10 years. But the overall best is if you both cooperate with one another. So that's where the, the reputation comes in. But there's a lot of cases where if it doesn't affect your reputation going forward, you're better off screwing over other people and that that leads to the impulse towards psychopathy but it's better for society as a whole and probably you for as a whole also if everyone cooperates yeah it it seems to me that while the situation boils down to like if you want to like super 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 simplify it and only look at short-term considerations then it seems to me that it works out the way you guys are describing but i mean if you Again, there are other considerations. I mean, no, no, no prisoner's dilemma in real life is going to be this simple. Um, and, and so most people are going to have long-term considerations, one of which is you screwed this guy over and he's going to get out of jail at some point and he's going to be pissed. <laughs> so, I mean, well, it, you, well, know, it, you it, have to think about that too. Yeah, but it, it, explains what, it explains the incentive for psychopathy. And yeah, Katie, you got that essential point that I missed. So that, thank you for that. But the prisoner's dilemma explains the incentive for psychopathy because Basically, a psychopath is someone who the the repeat iterations are just dialed down in importance, or the the community and the reputation and the uh, fellowship and the overall system is all just dialed down in importance, and just the se- immediate self interest is dialed up in importance. And that's like mm-hmm. this part of the psychopathic personality is they're uh, they don't value relationships that much. They're willing to move on really quickly. They're willing to just move to a completely different community pretty frequently. So, like a psychopathic strategy is basically like they're really only doing the reputation thing as much as it's in their immediate short-term self-interest, whereas most people are biased towards the community. So they'll even like, they'll sacrifice for the community to a greater extent really than is in their self-interest because they have these emotions that drive them to do so. I, I disagree right, exactly. with that. I disagree with that point. I, well, I think m- you're right that most psychopaths like dial down the interest towards, towards long-term uh, consequences, but an, an intelligent psychopath might sometimes play the the strategy where they do build up their reputation and they do behave consistently altruistically what distinguishes the psychopath is their motivation whereas most people have something innate in them that drives them towards that positive lovey-dovey strategy even when it's not in their self-interest a, a psychopath would just be calculating and their calculations may lead them to sometimes utilize the quote-unquote good strategy what I meant and what I was saying, maybe I didn't communicate properly, was the fact that psychopaths don't have that innate desire to be altruistic. They don't have that innate community-oriented sense. 
is the, that is the dial down of the, the importance of the reputation system in the community. So like a psychopath um, is only going to um, act collaborative, collaboratively with others as long as it's in their immediate clear self-interest. So that is what the dial down is. So a psychopath is like, let's say it's like there's some kind of prisoner's dilemma um, like, like, like Kurt's friend with poker. Like, let's say there's something where they do, um, a series, they have a series of business deals with, uh, with a business partner, let's say, and let's say there's 10 deals of, um, escalating value. They might cooperate on the first nine to like build a reputation of being someone who, um, is, has a, an honest spirit, but then maybe when a really big deal comes up with a large amount of money, maybe they'll just take the money and run. So it's like, it's not that they'll never cooperate, but it's that they're, perfectly willing to not cooperate if the situation arises where it's in their interest, whereas normal people generally are less so. Yeah. I think it's interesting, actually. I, most people's, normal people's strategy can, conforms very well to what uh, what mathematicians have found to be like the optimal strategy for prisoner's dilemma in game theory, which is something like, they call it tit for tat, which is basically assume cooperation and cooperate, but if somebody betrays you, then betray them right back. Uh, and then you can end up, the, the only problem with that strategy is you can end up getting in like a betrayal war and then everybody's worse off. So it, they say that, that the optimal strategy is to, to practice tit for tat with some, sometimes utilizing forgiveness and, and test your partner to see if they will behave cooperatively if you forgive them. And that's the best strategy or tends to be the best strategy for an individual and also for for both parties is to practice some for, form of tit for tat with cautious forgiveness. And that makes a lot of sense in society as well. And yeah. it really aligns with their morality. Yeah, well that, that's exactly, um, and it's interesting because that cycle of revenge is exactly what, it's, it's very, very common in societies around, in tribal societies, particularly around the world. And it's actually part of what the criminal justice system and the institution of the trial is meant to uh, disrupt. Because when you have like, um, you have in a lot of in a lot of tribal societies there ends up being intertribal conflict where it's like you killed my father so I killed your cousin and you killed my cousin so I killed your cousin and then you killed my mother and then I killed your and you end up with like a lot of the times tribes destroy each other over these kinds of wars of revenge and it was it was one of the most common sources of of violence and warfare in pre modern times and so what the trial does is the modern trial is you have let's say I kill Kurt's cousin. Instead of Kurt coming after me, what happens is the state comes after me. So that disrupts, that ends the cycle of violence because the state comes after me. I'm given a trial by and a group of strangers decides my innocence and guilt. And then I either, and then let's say I'm convicted. My family has no motivation to go after Kurt because if it was just like I kill Kurt's cousin, Kurt comes after me, Kurt kills me. Now my family's going after Kurt. Instead, the authority figure breaks the cycle of violence. And so that's that exact defect of that strategy is what is it's like the net the like our, our system is the evolution that's meant to to fix it. Kurt, did you want to respond to, <laughs> to any of that or Katie? Oh, I'll just mention quickly there's a very interesting presentation by David Friedman if you look on YouTube. It's called something like Systems of Law or Systems of Justice, which are very different to our own. And it describes that the history of the feud system that uh, Ariel is describing and some others. Going back to what we were talking about before, where, you know, the reason why we have these justice systems is because, or, or the reason why maybe re retributive justice or whatever it's called, you know, where you kind of talk it out with the person, the, the way, the reason why that might not be the best system of justice is because maybe the psychopath is this kind of, this kind of terminal case of psychopathy where there's no way to reform them. Um, and, you know, at some point in their life, they just, they just flip to the dark side and they become Darth Vader. Um, do you guys think that's uh, more or less permanent that, that, you know, once somebody's a psychopath, that they're always a psychopath? Or do you think that uh, something like in Return of the Jedi can happen where the, their son comes, comes and, and redeems them and then they turn back to the good side? I believe in neuroplasticity. I believe that people can change, but I believe that oftentimes it's an uphill battle. And perhaps in some cases, things are so ingrained that any reasonable amount of intervention would not be enough to turn the ship around. I know in Brazil, they started doing trials with hardened criminals and ayahuasca. So these these people, some of them murderers, mass murderers, or 
you know, very hardened criminals. And they, they took ayahuasca a few times and they were given psychological support and everything. And some of them, a lot of them apparently turned around and said, you know, I never realized how much pain that I was causing the people in the past. So it's hard to say whether these people were psychopaths, but maybe some of them would be labeled psychopaths. So I'd say, yeah, there's, there's hope. Yeah. I am actually really curious about the potential for psychedelics. And I mean, psychedelics are often called empathogens. They increase empathy in, in all people. And I would wonder if someone with a suppressed level of empathy or a low em- level of empathy, maybe something like psychedelics would be able to, would be enough to push them over to the edge into, you know, non-psychopathy. And they also allow for a lot of brain change and, and rapid neuro, neuroplasticity. So it, it seems like it could be promising. It might be. I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical too of this, but I, I mean, I don't know. It's hard to say, but I've definitely met people who are like really into ayahuasca or really into psychedelics and who, who still do like incredibly messed up things. Yeah, I mean, a psychedelic trip can go many different ways. So it could also potentially make things worse, make a psychopath more self-aware and calculating. It does seem to actually increase empathy, like the the feelings as well. So maybe if you were dealing with someone who wasn't completely at zero empathy, it, it could bump them up enough to where they'd feel it. It's possible. We really don't know. Yeah, I, I think one of the reasons why people get entrenched in certain habits is because those habits are producing results for them better than any other strategy. So I think if you're a young child and you learn that lying and cheating and stealing and being violent is giving you what you perceive, perceive to be benefits and maybe you try out being honest or something like that, and that doesn't go as well for you, then uh, it seems to me that you'll kind of start down the dark path. And as, as Yoda says, uh, once you start down the dark, dark path, forever will it dominate your destiny. Um, you know, and I think this is why we try to teach morality to kids early on so they don't start down the path. Um, but yeah, it seems to me that if you know, once, you, once you've started using these darker strategies, you get really good at using them. And so it becomes harder and harder for you to stop using those strategies because they're working so well for you. Does that mean that it's impossible to reform such people? I don't think so. I, I agree with um, whichever of you said that the brain is plastic. Um, <laughs> I think that was Katie. Um, that there's a lot of neuroplasticity. Um, I think it's possible for anybody to change any behavior, but the incentives just have to be large enough. And I think where sort of practical issues happen is, you know, is, is, is the cost of taking this person who basically proves themselves to be a psychopath. It's the cost of placing that person into jail, maybe for life, um, going to be, uh, is, is that going to be greater than or less than the cost of attempting to spending a bunch of resources attempting to reform them? And I think yeah. most societies have, have decided that throwing people in jail is the answer. Well, okay. I think there's a few different issues to deal with there. Like for one thing, the idea of changing behavior is different than the idea of changing whether or not someone's a psychopath. Cause someone who is a psychopath could conceivably in a certain environment, like behave in a very uh, pro social and functional way if they just fake it. But that's not really what we're talking about here. And another thing, Chris, it's like you're talking about like society having the choice between throwing people in jail who are psychopaths or reforming them. But society, like the problem isn't that society is just like they're just being an asshole here. Like there is no there is no known way to treat psychopathy. Like really personality disorders in general are like highly resistant to all kinds of treatment. So it's not like, you know, we have the magic pill and we're not using it. It's I mean, you know, maybe ayahuasca could work. That's very speculative, but we don't know any reliable way to get rid of psychopathy. Yeah, what I'm saying yeah. is well, that, what I'm saying is if you if you spend lots and lots of resources, I, I would say that eventually you could probably train any brain to change any behavior. Well, I don't. But, think, I don't the, think that's, I don't think that's true. I don't, I, don't, I don't think there's any evidence of that. I mean, could I take my? Could I take you know what's the dog's name again? Monster. Could we, take, could, we, could we take Monster the dog and? teach him to read if we just really tried hard enough like no that's never gonna happen i'm sorry like it's never gonna happen for monster 
And there's... I disagree. I think you could... I, you can teach 18 Maybe neurons how to fly a fighter jet. So you could probably teach a dog how to read, but it would be, again, it would be prohibitively expensive. It would probably be billions or trillions or quadrillions of dollars. It could be more... Uh, I, I, just, I disagree. I don't think a dog brain has the capacity to read. I disagree. I think if you... I, okay, so neurons are just these things that fire when their action potential is reached, right? So... Yeah, but it's not just a, a neuron that lets us read. There's more to it than that. Yeah. There's, there's a lot to it. Sure. And what it is, is it's, is it's training neurons to have certain, to, to have certain, I mean, all right. So reading. Well, is, well some of it is training. Activity. Yeah. Some of it is training. Some of it is adaptability and human brains are highly trainable and adaptable, but some of it is hardwired. And especially in non-human animals, more of it is hardwired. What's assumed in the skill of reading is that you're understanding that which you are reading. And understanding is is a hard problem. I mean that we don't even really know what that what that is. I, um, I, mean, I would say different things are hardwired. I would say different things are hardwired in human brains and animal brains. Like I would say, if it's between me and monster, and we have to teach one of us to recognize the smell of cocaine from a thousand feet, uh, you know that's quite the task. But I'd give it to monster. You know, mm-hmm. so it, it's we're just we're just our brains are optimized for different things, and it's not clear to me that. It's not clear to me exactly, like it's not clear to anyone exactly how plastic the brain is. Like maybe if we took Monster when he was just a single embryonic cell and we did something to that embryonic cell, maybe Monster could grow into a man. Like we don't, we don't know exactly I mean, how so- plastic things might be, but it's pretty clear that when Monster is a full-grown dog with our current level of technology, there is no known pathway for teaching him to read. Yeah, I, I wanted to bring up here the idea of primary versus secondary psychopathy also. Because in the literature, there's a, there's a distinction between people who are primary psychopaths who they believe are, are born psychopathic, like maybe just without the capacity for empathy. Like that's just not, it's just not in their brain. It's, it's not something that computes as opposed to secondary psychopaths who are more likely to come from situations or abuse where they have suppressed their empathy to such a degree where their behavior is basically indistinguishable from other types of psychopaths, but with some minor differences. And I would imagine that if there is any kind of treatment, treating a secondary psychopath would be much, it it would be very different from treating a primary psychopath. And it's like, all this is controversial, you know, we don't like, go ahead, Kurt. Sure. So assuming Chris is right, and somebody could actually change any thought process, any any behavior in their brain. I think generally a psychopath would actually have to want to change, and that's the weird thing about it. Because if if psychopaths really are like this and purely manipulative and predatory, then all they're going to see when you present them an opportunity to change is how can I turn this to my benefit. How can I turn this into a win-lose situation? And they're not going to think, how can I become a better person? Well, yes, maybe. Uh, Or you might come up with a set of incentives that allows them to turn back into a good person. I mean, I'm not saying that, that, you know, this is, this is, this is. How would incentives, how would incentives cause actual feelings of empathy? I understand how incentives could cause different behavior, and, and cause a psychopath to behave like a good person, but incentives are psychopathic in and of themselves. Like the, the whole point of psychopathy is that they don't respond to things other than selfish in- incentives. I think the idea would be to give somebody an incentive to change and then also give them a, a treatment, which is not just based on the incentives. I mean, are, are there any examples historical examples of sort of the Darth Vader redemption story. Well, I think there are plenty. I, I think that we're, we're doing something false by equating psychopathy with like bad people or bad actors, not psychopathy. doesn't necessarily mean you're a bad person or a bad actor. And maybe that would be because of incentives, because the incentives are, are for you to be a good person and to behave well. But as long as we're dealing in the language of incentives, we're not anywhere close to treating psychopathy. And, and it's also like vice versa. Like someone can do evil things and not be a psychopath. Like if one sticks to the Star Wars theme. Spoiler alert if anybody hasn't seen Star Wars. Like in, the, in that Star Wars movie, um, The Force Awakens, where 
the guy who's played by Adam Driver, Kylo Ren, like when he kills Harrison Ford, who's his father, who's Han Solo. Also, that is, uh, by the way, that's like the most predictable twist I've ever seen in a movie. <laughs> um, okay, so basically like in The Force Awakens, so you have the Kylo Ren um, kill Han Solo and they clearly portray him as not being a psychopath because he's fe- clearly feeling um, guilt and um, he's like conflicted and like the camera shows like his face all divided and he's being pulled between like good and evil. And um, when he does it, he feels a lot of pain and like like the love that he has to kill within him. So it's like, it's, it's clearly in that story, he's being portrayed as someone who's doing an evil thing, but who's not a psychopath. And probably most people who do evil things are not psychopaths. And well, like, that's yeah, a story, that's a, that's a story that might end in a redemption arc, but it's not, you know, someone being cured of psychopathy. It's someone who is like a complex person who has many different emotions, uh, finding a different moral balance. Well, and, and you could say the same thing about Darth Vader himself. The, apparently, the reason why he turned from the good side to the bad side is because his mother gets killed. And so then he, you know, goes on a rampage. And, and But the, the important thing is that he discovers that he, you know, he actually enjoys being evil. And then you know, that's, that's the moment where he starts down the dark path, right? And then, you know, he, he kind of gets better and better and better at being evil. Eventually, he's just totally, you know, seemingly irredeemable. Oh, no. Did I just ruin Star Wars for Katie? You haven't seen it, right? I, oh. I I know the whole plot. Oh, sorry. I've, I've, I've been living in this world. <laughs> it's okay. Sorry. I've never seen. No, no, it's totally fine. I've never seen Star Wars, but I I know enough about. Wait, it. just kidding. Darth Vader never gets redeemed. It's it's like it, that never happens. Uh, he's he's, he's a good guy the whole time. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, oh shit, Katie, you have to watch Star anyway. <laughs> no, I I really, oh, well I don't know. <laughs> Do I anyway, have- so so, <laughs> so what, what I'm trying to say is. Every time, every time we talk about, you know, can can a psychopath be redeemed? Then it's like, and then we bring up exa- examples of people, you know, uh, like w- what was that story that somebody told earlier about? Uh, I think it was John, what's his name, the guy who gave the, the the TED talk on on psychopathy, where he had John this, Ronson. What was his name? Ronson, John Ronson. John, yeah, John Ronson. So, so you know, um, I guess he's not a psychopath or something like that, right? Or is he? I don't know. <laughs> Presumably he's not. So in the in the book, The Psychopath Test and in the TED presentation, he goes through the process and starts to realize, hang on, by l- labeling people as, as psychopaths and seeing them like these objects to be analyzed, I'm actually becoming a little bit psychopathic. But uh, I don't think he's a psychopath. Right. I mean, it, it seems like there's this kind of moving goalpost thing where, you know, whenever we try to bring up a practical example of somebody who's a psychopath, we, can, we can't pin it down because it, it seems like, uh, you know, if, if there's at all a chance that psychopaths could be redeemed, then in those cases, the person wasn't really a psychopath. It's kind of like the, the no true Scotsman uh, type thing. Yeah, that's right. Well, we'd have to have a clear... A, a clear standard for, for what a psychopath is. So I think a lot of people w- maybe would use the hair checklist or the Cleckley checklist. But I think <laughs> also if somebody scores high on the hair checklist and later scores low on the hair checklist, people might say, well, they've just learned to deceive. <laughs> yeah, or conversely, they were never a psychopath to begin with. Maybe. I mean, I think part of the value of the concept of a psychopath is this idea that like, it problematizes this idea that anybody can be redeemed and that you just have to believe in the goodness in each human being and that that goodness will be fostered if it's just given some love. Like there is something naive about that idea. And I think the, the, the concept of a psychopath just shows that if you approach everyone in the world in that way, you can be manipulated. Well, okay. Here's a different question though. Could like, I, I would think, the, the way that I think about potential redemption of psychopaths isn't curing their psychopathy. It's of, I guess, manipulating their psychopathy into something good, <laughs> if that's possible. Like, you, psychopaths can be motivated by a lot of different things, maybe like power, money, comfort. If psychopaths certainly enjoy things. They get entertained by things. It, would there be the possibility of a psychopath who really got off on seeing other people happy, for example, like would that, is that even possible? I don't know if you could turn somebody into that, but I don't see why it's impossible. 
Well, yeah, or, well, or like the Dexter TV show where he um, goes after serial killers and is maybe a psychopath, maybe not. It's not clear. And there's the real-life example of James Fallon, the neurologist I talked about earlier, who seems to be mainly motivated by a desire to be a famous celebrity neurologist with money and attention. And he did, he's done a lot of valuable things. Like he, he did a lot of really valuable research on various topics, including psychopathy, and wrote a really engaging book about it and helped reveal a lot about the psychology of psychopathy, even though his motivations are like selfish. Mm-hmm. Another example is well, when they do surveys of different occupations, surgeons rate really highly on, on, on traits of psychopathy and like there tend to be a lot of psychopathic surgeons, which this makes perfect sense to me because for regular people, it's probably really difficult to cut bodies open. Uh, but for surgeons, they are detached from that. But a, a lot of them want to help people or do some kind of good in the community. Anecdotally, and I don't want to name any names, the the few people that I have met that I suspect are psychopaths are highly driven to do what they consider good in the world. Does their idea of good align with what most of us would think of good? Or do they have very <laughs> for, diverse ideas? Uh, no, for the most part, for the most part, their idea of good aligns with what most people would think of as good they might be more willing to compromise on means sometimes or maybe it it seems like they're detached from other people's emotions and feelings in a way and like they're detached from their own emotions and feelings in a way and are very in control of their behavior at all times and can can act however they want to in any given situation and have no fear and <laughs> all those things, but uh, maybe they, they seem to be trying to do good, like even in ways that we would think about it. I'd like to introduce this other way of looking at it. So when I, I did this interview with Dr. Aidan Gregg, who is a research psychologist at the University of Southampton, and he has this other idea that he calls a, a poco curante. So he says, this, you know, we have psych- psychopathy, sociopathy, antisocial personality disorder. So he came up with this this new way of, of drawing the boundaries. And a, a poco curante is basically somebody who doesn't give a damn, and they don't give a damn about the three key areas, which is truth, people, and the future. So the, the truth doesn't matter to a poco curante. They can say whatever and feel no remorse, or feel no discomfort about lying to people. And they don't care about people. They don't. They don't think of, uh, about other people as people, I guess. <laughs> and they don't care about the future. And that's why we would say a lot of psychopaths end up in prison because they don't. They don't plan about you know what's my escape plan or what. How am I going to avoid getting caught for this or something like that? And it's also that poker guarantees don't don't care about their own future. So it's like they can't empathize with themselves in the future. And they can't think about, well, how, how am I going to look at this next week or, or next month? And I think we all, we all have a, a bit of that. I was just going to say that. That kind of reminds me of uh, the Joker in The Dark Knight, where they say, mm-hmm. like, some men just want to watch the world burn. Right. Yeah. And that's another, I guess there's another motivation there. It's not like just wanting to see chaos. But in the case of the Joker, the the Joker can think about the future. So this is the interesting part of it. So you can have poker curantes who are not complete. So you can have a person who cares about people, but not about the truth or the future. And that will be like this archetypical hippie. They travel from from place to place and might not have have many possessions and just take life as it comes and that's fine for them or maybe even uh, a homeless person like they well a homeless person will probably be they they're probably truthful they're probably honest people and they probably care about people a lot of homeless people are are nice uh, but they don't think too much about the future or they they can't think about the future perhaps and then you have like uh, the the psychopathic politicians and CEOs 
who care very much about the future, but they don't care about the truth and they care very little about people. Yeah, that's a, an interesting way to look at it. It definitely points to uh, this whole psychopathy thing is, is much more complicated than uh, uh, it seems at first. A lot of this conversation is reminding me of a conversation that we had way back when, I think it was in the Jim and Andy episode, about viewing life as a canvas and being able to do whatever you want with it and how that could lead you to just want to destroy everything or you could be led to want to do something extremely beautiful and nice with it. And I guess in the case of a person who doesn't feel empathy or isn't constrained by fear or emotion, I could also see that going multiple ways. Like it seems like psychopathy could be turned towards something good or turned towards something being it turned towards something very powerful. I don't know. It depends on if that selfishness is, is inherent in our definition of psychopathy or if it's just about the, the not feeling fear and not feeling certain emotions. Right. Yeah. Like, and one interesting thing that, um, uh, Hitchens says about uh, psychopaths is they don't have a true sense of humor or aesthetics. So it's a little bit different because I can imagine, I don't, I think someone who is purely self-interested wouldn't, doesn't quite have the same potential for destruction as someone who is purely motivated by aesthetics. Because if you are purely motivated by aesthetics without consideration for moral or ethics, it seems to me that you could just do anything. Like it doesn't seem to me that it would be any difference between destroying the world or between writing a short story where the world gets destroyed. It's just whatever fits your, you just do whatever fits your aesthetic sense. And that seems to me more dangerous, and more potentially unconstrained. Creating stuff tends to be more fun than destroying stuff on the whole. That's what I find. Destruction can be just as aesthetic for people as creation. Like that's the whole point of Burning Man is you create something and then you destroy it. And there's something cathartic about that. And there's something aesthetically pleasing and, mor- yes, and morally. First. So that that's true for, for maybe you and me, but like there are some people who seem to have a very different orientation towards like how they react to things. Like you ever encounter people who find other people being injured funny? Yeah. Or who, who just like to, you know, knock down stuff that other people build or burn stuff that other people build. Mm-hmm. definitely exist who like who who enjoy kicking small animals mel brooks said mm-hmm. that tragedy is when i get a paper cut and comedy is when you fall down a manhole and die yeah i mean to a certain extent we all find to a certain extent i think it's pretty rare to find someone who would never find violence entertaining or have a positive emotional reaction i mean like the, the video where like richard spencer was punched like all kinds of like leftists or into that or like you know osama bin laden being killed all kinds of non otherwise non-violent people were cheering that on like yeah well i don't think that means they're all psychopaths but that's my number one red flag in a person but that's because you come from the ancap world well no i mean that was long i came from an ancap world for like I was in an ANCAP world for like four years, but that was my main deal like forever. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I shouldn't tell you what you are or aren't, but I mean, it seems to me. It was the reason why I was drawn towards voluntarism, but. I mean, it seems to me to be biased because like, I mean, probably people who are drawn to like voluntarism are people who just find violence very like, um, I don't know, unesthetic or find it to be particularly egregious for whatever psychological reason. And then there's people who are like drawn to the left or people who more find like inequality or greed or these other things to be particularly egregious, but have a certain tolerance for violence. Yeah. I, sh- I should note too, there's plenty of ANCAPs that like get really, really happy seeing a cop get hurt or who are really, they're all about the non-aggression principle, but like they, they really, really love the idea of, of defense and, you know, descen- defending themselves very fervently. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, it, I don't think all libertarians or ANCAPs don't have a violent orientation. I mean, there's an obsession with guns. <laughs> right. So, so, so Hinchins cool. does say that uh, all people feel these 
predator emotions. Uh, he says that the difference between psychopaths and social humans is that psychopaths feel only the predator emotions, but social humans also feel the predator emotions. And the difference is that, uh, you know, it's, it's not people, people, um, People don't feel normal. People do not feel the predator emotions against other people, uh, except in things like sports and war. Uh, and so, you know, as long as as long as you know, as long as it's it's the out group, then a lot of times there are kind of these socially acceptable venues where the predator emotions against other humans are perfectly acceptable. And sales, we are brought up the example of sales. I don't know. It seems like there's a lot of situations. Yeah, that's true. I shouldn't act holier than that. Actually, I just had this conversation with Chris the other night. <laughs> I tend to think of like, oh yeah, I don't get into sports. I don't like pe- seeing people get beat down or whatever. But if if you're in a board game with me, like all those predatory emotions come out really strong. <laughs> yeah, like so glee <laughs> is like is like the the joy at feeling your at seeing your prey stumble. <laughs> you know, you like ha ha. I have you now. Yeah. There's certainly like a lot of men who are predatory towards women. And I don't think it's purely a psychopathic thing. Like it's in, in any, in any community or organization where there's like young women hanging around, there'll be like a kind of orbit of like middle-aged men. Like, yeah. I mean, I I think, think, I think this has a lot to do with just how sexual economics work out. Like, men maybe seem to want sex a little bit more than the average woman or, or, or something. I don't know, but we, we all know, I think we all can notice that there's like a, a, a drive that men have to want to get women. And so for some men, it becomes very gamified. Yeah. And I guess like, I think of like the counter argument is like, I know this guy who's like uh, very wealthy and he definitely experiences a lot of female attention as like predatory. I guess that's a, I guess that's a counter example in a way. Yeah, it's just a, it's a rare, I think it's a rare man who experiences the opposite from women, but I've, I've definitely witnessed it happen with men who are like very, very, very attractive. They'll have like, I don't want to say swarms, but <laughs> maybe swarms of women around them. Think of like the classic boy band that has throngs of screaming fans who are just trying to get a moment of their attention you know yeah the beatles or justin bieber i I can't believe i just said those in the same sentence i I think (laughs) i think part of it like what comes to mind is like the martin buber thing like the i it mode versus the iu mode like have we talked about this before many times yeah in the pickup artistry episode this came up quite a bit yeah yeah so basically just to sum up for the audience like uh the basic idea martin buber wrote this book i and now and the idea is there's two ways to relate to people one is the I it mode where you're basically relating to them as objects that you can use in some way. And they're like, um, and in that way of approaching the world is like the world's divided into categories and objects and each object has a use. And there's the I thou mode where the person that you're dealing with uh, takes on like an infinite value. And in that mode, they're not comparable to anyone else. And you're relating to them on like a deeper level of like cosmic or spiritual connection that is um that has no that has where there's no calculation of of utility going on at all right where the other person has a, a divine spark where every individual yeah. has a divine spark and you yeah it, it, they, yeah they have a divine spark and they're used to becomes irrelevant and it seems to me that psychopaths probably cannot enter into that second mode i would agree with that yeah so so one thing that we haven't gotten to yet that i've been wanting to get to is the so hinchens talks about you know you, you can't you can't really just look at somebody and be like, oh, that's a psychopath. You have to kind of, he said, like look sideways at them by their reflection off of other people. And he says that there's this kind of characteristic impact crater that uh, psychopaths leave. And then you can be like, okay, there's a psychopath here somewhere. And now we have to do more um, investigation to figure out exactly who it is. I, I think that's one way. Definitely there is this thing that, that Hinton's talks about. And I agree with that psychopaths tend to suck energy out of other people. So if, if you're noticing your energy being sucked or a group of people where your energy is being sucked, that's probably a clue. But I, I do think that you can identify a psychopath by looking at them. Like visually or by observing? No, not, not visually, but by observing them, specifically by observing their emotional reactions to different stimuli. True. Yeah. I think Hinchin says one of the... Um one of the easiest ways to identify a psychopath is that they don't feel, they don't feel shame and they, they and they, uh, or they, they pretend to feel shame, but they don't show this like uh, flushing. They don't, they, they don't blush. 
and they don't have they're like their ears turn, don't turn red. Whereas um, a normal social human, when they feel shame, their ears are going to flush. I mean, there's a lot of things because many psychopaths are good at faking social emotions and stuff like that. But there are some things that tend to pop out like what Ariel said, psychopaths not having a really genuine sense of humor or psychopaths not having a good sense of aesthetics or psychopaths being more likely to get excited about violence or, or fights rather than turn away. They tend to be impulsive. They tend to, you know, be oriented towards selfish things. Yeah. But I think Hinchins would say all of that isn't, you know, sufficient, uh, maybe necessary, but not sufficient to like definitely beyond the shadow of a doubt, identify whether somebody's a psychopath. It, yeah. I don't know if you can get there definitely beyond a standard of a doubt, but. Yeah. I think the more important thing is to assess whether somebody is actually some kind of threat, like it doesn't matter if they're actually a psychopath or not. It matters if they're going to take advantage of you and you're going to end up in this situation where they win and you lose. Well, that gets into the next question, but I mean, I I think it, it does kind of matter whether someone's a psychopath or not. It's just, it's just a basic evaluation of trying to understand other people's inner lives. And it's hard to deal with people if you don't do that. Like if there's someone, um, like if I'm in some kind of competitive mode with someone and we could end up in a win-lose situation, it's very different whether they're a psychopath versus whether they're, um, let's say, someone who's hardworking and just believes that their way is the right way because that person could be convinced because in that case, the difference between us is we have a cognitive difference. So we're, in, we're at odds. Like we have, we have a difference in belief. And that is something that is very different to approach than from approaching someone who's a psychopath and who, um, you know, it just doesn't have any empathy for other people and just wants to destroy me or wants to take advantage of me. Like, like it's a completely different situation in either case. And each case requires a different approach. Definitely. And I think another thing about trying to assess the threat with people is like, if you're dealing with someone who's maybe psychopathic, then it you wouldn't just analyze, you wouldn't just assess whether or not they're a threat based on their behavior towards you and like based on their history. I think it's important to recognize like if someone's behavior is not constrained by emotion or empathy, then they could flip in a way that others could not. Yeah, because that's the, that's the thing is like, you got to really look at whether people are, <laughs> if someone does seem to have a very narrow, I mean, okay, like reading this book was like really strange for me because as I was reading it, I was like thinking about a lot of people from my past. Like there was definitely a lot of people. I was definitely like reading it kind of with like a hand over my mouth in a way. It was a weird book to read for me. And there's a part of me that's like, oh, well, it's probably not healthy to think about these people as psychopaths, which we'll get to in our next. I guess we're on that question now of whether even this is a model that is. Whether this model has utility or has risk or whatnot. So there's a part of me that feels like, oh, this isn't how I should look at things because it's healthier to just uh, always look to my own behavior and see what I could have done differently every time a conflict comes up. But if there are psychopaths and psychopaths exist and like they come up in your life, then that does require a certain approach. It does seem like recognizing that that's the situation. Like if someone really does have a very constrained um, bandwidth of human emotion, that's mainly based around self-interest and predation, that's kind of an important thing to keep in, to keep in mind. Yeah. So when, when Katie mentioned that, that you know, you know, it's, it's important to, to know whether the person is a psychopath, because if they are, then, you know, you don't know what their emotional state is and they could flip at any moment. That reminded me of the story of the, of Siegfried and Roy, when um, they were these two circus, uh, like tiger trainers who had some tigers and they would do tricks with the tigers. And so tigers are predators. Um, they're basically, you know, basically all cats are basically psychopaths. Um, but, you know, for, for long stretches of time, you can basically be friends with them as long as, you know, that's how the incentives work out. But as soon as, as soon as the cat feels that, you know, something is, something is different or something is off or, or, you know, it might have some advantage by attacking you, then it's going to do that. And so I, I think, you know, I think it is actually useful to kind of model psychopaths that way. Yeah, I was I was thinking about cats actually throughout this book, and I, I think I think you're right. Like I think that cats are basically all psychopathic. <laughs> cats are psychopaths, and dogs are fascists. Yeah, and that's why they love pictures of themselves on the internet. <laughs> uh, yeah, base. I think that's a great example. 
I think the Siegfried, Siegfried Roy example is a great example. And I think it also demonstrates another really important thing about psychopaths that we haven't really got into, but they're extremely charismatic. So like when you're dealing with someone who's a psychopath and it's early in the relationship, like it's a very, it's very all consuming and engrossing and like they're turning their charm onto you and it feels really good. Like it can feel like, like love or like closeness or like connection. And if, if you're not really tuned in to the idea of a psychopath, then you're not really going to be thinking in that case, like, oh, they're taking advantage of me. Like if you're not using the construct of a psychopath, you're not going to start thinking they're taking advantage of me, of me until you're really, really deep into it. So that's sort of why I think it's just important to have this model in mind. I don't know. Well, and and so uh, Hinchins says, you know, you can kind of feel, you can kind of feel it if you're paying attention for it, you can kind of feel it when the person first starts getting their hooks into you. You can feel them like, like, like asking you to do random favors for no reason, you know, and, and like, you know, just, just kind of giving you commands and, and, and just seeing if you follow them. And then if you start doing that, then they'll start you know, give them an inch and they'll take a mile, basically. On the yeah. flip side, though, like thinking about being constantly on the lookout for psychopaths could make you very paranoid and perhaps damage some relationships. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is the way. kind of thing that, that maybe you prime it in the back of your mind, but you don't necessarily hold it in the front of your mind thinking about every person that you meet. But personally, like I said, it's, a, it's very hard for me to say if I've ever met a, a psychopath so i have to wonder how valuable it is to think about it like i've never i've never had so much problem like some somebody charming me and taking me in or trying to take my money or, or something like that and i i don't know i i guess there's a, a greater context about the way i am <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if i have some kind of inbuilt psychopath repellent or something they see i'm not an easy target i have no idea so so maybe my experience is is different to other people's well i mean you also come from like a non-abusive intact family that's true right. well and and as hinchins notes you know uh again predators are are going to ignore probably you know kurt you're you're male you're pretty tall <laughs> you know um maybe Maybe you're not trained in martial arts or something like that, but most predators are going to look at you and be like, eh, it's not worth it. You know, they're looking for yeah. people who are weak. And I should elaborate on, I, weak. I should elaborate on what I just said. Like, like people who, they also, they look for people who like have trauma or people who like have some kind of wound when you have like a wound from like your childhood or from very young. And like, you're always trying to like fill it. Like there's a certain kind of love you didn't receive. Like someone who's a predator or a psychopath can see that and can, can, can sort of like almost like instinctively, they just sort of turn into that thing for you. And that's part of where the addictive dynamic comes in. So if you're someone who came from like a stable, loving, intact family, then you don't, you kind of don't quite have so much that they can hook into. Right. So in the book, Hinchins describes this behavior called shotgunning, where a, a psychopath will throw out a, a series of sentences at you and see which ones you react to. And that's how they get an idea of what your buttons are so they can later push them. I think psychopaths often also look for highly empathetic people because someone who's highly empathetic is going to be easier to manipulate with guilt. Yeah, exactly. Because like that's that's kind of like the problem often with highly empathetic people is like uh, they can see it from both sides. So like they have like a spotlight going from their side, but they also have a spotlight going from the other side. And so it's like you like just rapidly iterate between the two sides and it's like hard to see which side is the correct side. And then you end up with some kind of like synthesis of like, oh, well, the true side is the one from above where this is my perspective and this is their perspective. And there's both a little bit. And when you do that too much or and like a dysfunctional empathetic person who's like self-effacing will only see it from the other side and they'll never stand up for themselves. And so that's the really that's where it becomes, you become really vulnerable to psychopaths because they're also only seeing it from their side. So it's like, you're only seeing it from their side and they're only seeing it from their side and your side never gets a say. Yeah. So um, going back a step and, and thinking about, uh, you know, when you, you know, a lot of times they target these highly empathetic, em empathetic people or even people who kind of look wounded from previous relationships with psychopaths. Um, this is exactly the reason why Hinchin's, uh, does not recommend just running away if you're in, in a relationship with a psychopath. Um, 
And why basically the reason why you don't want to do that is because you still have all of that damage. And so you're still going to be vulnerable to other psychopaths, even when, you know, even when you're, you're away from that particular one. And so he actually, the last uh, couple of chapters of the book are dedicated to, you know, if you are entangled in a, in a, in a predatory relationship with the psychopath, you know, you need to follow these steps to kind of, kind of, you know, gather evidence, gain back your power, figure out their, their methods. And then eventually you can end the relationship on your own terms. And not only have you ended the relationship with the psychopath, but you're also healed and you're not going to be vulnerable in the future. You know, that's one of the reasons why I, I want to recommend this book uh, to people. Um, it seems like good advice. Oh, I was going to say, I really liked that part as well. I, I just wanted to add though, like in some cases, it's probably better to run away first and then do your evaluation later because oftentimes relationships with psychopaths are dangerous. <laughs> Yeah. Although it's worth noting also that in abusive relationships, uh, the violence is most likely to start after the often women in these safe situations of abusive relationships that are documented by the police. But let's say after the victimized person has already ran, like post-separation violence is uh, the most, um, it's the most com- post-separation is the most common ty- time for relationship violence to begin. So often the act of running away precipitates <laughs> I mean, not, you know, abusers aren't necessarily psychopaths and there's a lot of reasons why that can happen. But I mean, a big part of it is like for, from the psychopath's perspective, it's like, like he talks about how like psychopaths aren't like, like violence is often a last resort. Like a violence is a blunt tool that often isn't very effective, but if it's all that you have left, you'll just turn to violence if it's the only way to get what you want. I don't know. I really like the idea of standing up for yourself instead of running away. I, I mean, I, I do think it's like, you know, often like he's kind of right. Like there is almost like a hysteria in society around like, like connecting like psychopathy with like linking psychopathy with violence. And just like, you just got to get out no matter what, no matter, you know, if you're a broken person or not. But I mean, sometimes when you, when someone is like um, preying on you or someone is like, (laughs) has treated you really badly, it can be powerful when you have the chance to like say the thing you need to say or to stand up for yourself and to at least end on like a note of like dignity. Yeah, it's also very interesting if you do stand up for yourself to watch how how that person reacts. I don't I don't know. At least in my experience, uh, I don't know if I've dealt with psychopaths, but I've had a few experiences where I felt like there was some kind of a predatory relationship going on. And when you finally like break the illusion of what was happening and and stand up to that person, you can just kind of watch them spin. <laughs> like it's like this confusion <laughs> comes across their face, and they're like grasping. For, for what to say to you to, to, to put your illusion hat back on. <laughs> Some of the things Hinchins talks about in the book towards the end uh, about defending yourself from psychopaths, like he's talking about setting the tone of any exchange, like you can come in friendly or generous or cold or outright hostile. And he also says, if someone is sinking, if someone is trying to sink that soul draining fangs into you or yours, I think you're justified in using whatever force you need to make them stop and or go away. And he talks about using the techniques of a psychopath against them. And I think it goes back to that quote from Nietzsche, where he says, one who fights with monsters must be careful not to become a monster himself. So, and, and uh, likewise, Ronson said those similar things about seeing people as psychopaths or evaluating them as psychopaths. So, I think people have to be careful. If they read this book, you have to be careful about how you apply this advice. Yeah, I mean, that's where I could see this becoming really risky because it's not always possible to know who is a psychopath. And often when you're like inside the story of your life, it's very easy to vilify the other people around you, which is probably as big a risk as encountering psychopaths. And for many people is probably a greater tendency. And it almost seems like in the wrong hands, this book could just become a a tool for someone who's like lacking in self-reflection to just blame everyone around them for their problems or just to like scapegoat someone for being a psychopath and for causing problems that may be a lot more complex in origin. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely true. And I, I think if you label someone a psychopath, it often sends you into that I it mode because then all of a sudden you're dealing with like this archetype of someone who you're not even really seeing as human. And that I mean, one, you might be wrong, but 
like too, it, it, it can, I, I don't know. It's just kind of a nasty, nasty way to look at people. It would probably lead you to treating that person pretty badly. I think there's just kind of a general condition of being vulnerable to other people. And I think it has to do with not having well-defined boundaries. And I think as I was, as I was growing up, I, I'm not sure I ever encountered any actual psychopaths, but um, looking back on my life, it seems like the whole world was like a, like a vampire, you know, uh, it, it, like just because I didn't have, I didn't have properly defined boundaries. And I think, you know, even if you're not dealing directly with some psychopath, I think the advice at the end of this book can be empowering just to people who, who are, um, who are vulnerable and to kind of take back your power. And, you know, what, once you kind of define boundaries, then you stop being all paranoid and you stop seeing the world as this threatening, you know, vampiric place. And it, it becomes much more friendly, I would say. What do you guys think about this, this stat that's often cited, like one in 25 people are a psychopath? I think I, I've heard another version. It's one in a hundred people are psychopaths, and it goes to one in twenty-five when you talk about politicians or CEOs. It's hard for me to say because it's like there's a few competing models in my mind. Like one, one model would be uh, there aren't any psychopaths, and it's important. Sort of what Kurt is articulating a little bit. Maybe it's, it's just important to just focus on the self and improve the self, and everything will follow. I mean, another model is that psychopathy isn't necessarily a binary thing, but it's a tendency within each of us. And so it's just the question just becomes how many people have like a critical, a critical mass of psychopathic traits. I mean, another model is like I used to sort of think in the like psychopath, sociopath, narcissist triad. But I mean, I almost do kind of like his model that there's just that's just almost just losing the forest for the trees. If I was it's, it's hard to say, because like if I think back on people in my life that I've known, I can definitely think of some where it fit a lot of these models pretty closely, but it's also like in some cases there's exceptions like, oh, that person did really like art. So maybe there was something else going on there. But right, it, it, according to Hinchin's psychopaths don't like artistic expression. One in 25, it, it seems like, I think he's probably right that it's a lot higher because I think that's based on crime statistics. And if we're accepting this model of psychopath, of psychopathy, where it's not necessarily um, defined by, violence and impulsiveness but it's just defined by having this narrow emotional range and being self-interested it does seem like it would be a lot higher than the people who get scooped up by the criminal justice system because all you'd need to be was just um a little bit smarter and forward thinking and you'd you'd be able to get a much better life by never getting arrested at all so it does seem to me that something like four percent four percent is probably more accurate if we're accepting this model I, I just did some Googling uh, just to try to clarify this because I wasn't 100% sure. And I've, I found a bunch of different estimate, estimations. Like for the general population, the estimates seem to be between 1% and 4%. So between 1 in 100 and 1 in 25. And then for the prison population, the estimates were around 25 to 40%. And then for CEOs, I could only find one stat. There might be more out there. But just in my quick search, I found approximately 23%. Of CEOs. Well, and if you if you read all the way to the end of the book into the frequently asked questions section, um, they they talk about this this incidence of psychopaths, and he he talks about how it's kind of a cycle. It's this this never ending arms race between psychopaths and social humans, and uh, you know sometimes there are more psychopaths and sometimes there are less psychopaths, just like in any in an ecosystem. Sometimes there are more lions and sometimes there are more gazelles. It swings back and forth based on the uh, kind of. Uh, abundance of society in general. And so I think maybe what you're seeing today in our society is that we have a lot of material abundance. And so the, the precedence of sort of self-serving behavior is increasing a lot. You guys ready to wrap up? Yeah. I want to give us a conclusion, Chris. Okay. Well, that uh, wraps up our episode for today. Thank you audience for coming out on coming with us on this journey into the depths of the minds of this creature that we call psychopath. We hope that you enjoyed it. We hope that if you decide to apply this model to your life, that you take it with a grain of salt and do all of your own research and be careful. If you enjoyed this content and want to see more of it, please like and subscribe and support us on Patreon and click on our affiliate links. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us on the Multiversity Project. We hope you found this episode both mind-bending and enjoyable. We can be found all over the social media space and at multiversitypodcast.com. If you like this content, 
give us a like, comment, follow, share, or support us on Patreon. Catch you on the flip side.